Hey everyone, it's Zach with Palantir Research. Palantir has gone through a bumpy week, especially for us investors, speculators, traders, depending on how you played it, some new and some who've been around for a while. It really doesn't matter. So we'll go through the week just to show where Palantir stands news-wise, with some I've covered, of course, in previous videos, but a lot of the smaller or quick stuff I've compiled here, like new customer links or institutional buyers. Of course, earnings we're going to cover briefly also. And then my perspective on all of this, especially with the recent volatility in the upwards and downward direction. So earnings first, I made a whole video here, so that's for more details. After my digestion of the results, and the headline for me is the billion dollar buyback approval and meeting their own guidance, raising guidance for next quarter and the year, but also the expectations of Wall Street or even some new folks were not met, especially around the 13% year over year growth for the quarter. But that's actually within the expectations of the company. But there are a lot of leading indicators that I do go to into detail that make me very optimistic for the future. So there is a true bump in demand for AIP in my opinion, and remember that Q2 is only a partial quarter since AIP was announced in April. So Q3 will be a full quarter here and will be exciting to see how this turns out. So that's just a quick summary, but basically check out my video if you want the deeper details on what metrics are giving me a lot of optimism. Also, this week there was an announcement of a multi-year partnership with Azul Energy out in Angola. This entity is a 50-50 between BP and Eni, which is an Italian oil company. So it's a sparse deal with no details, of course, of the dollars or time frame. But I do talk a bit about the possible reasonings on my video on why this deal probably came to be. So now on the new side here that I haven't covered, Kathy Wood bought some more shares of Palantir this week, August 8th and August 9th. She bought around 940,000 shares across her different funds. This is after earnings and when the price dipped. Now, for me personally, I don't make my investment or buying decisions on this kind of activity, but it is at least newsworthy for the community to see that there are prolific big money, especially Kathy making these kind of trades. Next, Ether Square tweets or X's are about a couple new links this week from 8VC and the other being Novo Nordisk. 8VC is interesting for sure because they are invested in Palantir, so it's kind of a double whammy for them to possibly be using the software themselves and really putting their money where their mouth is. So of course, EtherSquare is going to continue monitoring this. Then for Novo, they're a huge pharmaceutical play around $300 billion market cap. Uh, I know them mostly for their diabetes medicine, Ozempic. That's to help with insulin production. So we know Palantir is becoming a major player in the life sciences space, especially with drug research and discovery there. So we've seen news around in the past few weeks around that. It's always nice to see more expansion here. So I'm shouting out to Ether Square, all this great work, uncovering these potential clients and partnerships that are happening in the background. Now, next is Dan Ives. He's been making his rounds on the retail side of Palantir News post earnings, doing an interview with Tom Nash that's already posted on YouTube for those who want to review it. Also, at least at the time of recording, it's going to happen on Friday, August 11, 4 p.m. Central or 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Dan Ives will be on X Spaces with Arnie and Amit, so always great to check out what others are thinking about Palantir's business. Now, just a word of caution, we're in the age of information for sure, where the hard part isn't finding or getting info about something, but sifting through what is important for you and your investing thesis, so always keep that in mind. Now, this transitions perfectly to my own thoughts and opinions on this rocky week, or even past few weeks, I guess, if you want to take that into perspective. Now, if you've been in Palantir, of course, throughout 2022, I'm not sure if this really matters or if you felt the same way, but either way, it's not financial advice, but my preface is I'm long on Palantir and a bull and optimistic on their business, not only on the small clues in their official earnings and immaculate balance sheet, which gives them flexibility, of course but also the qualitative factors like their mission that aligns with Western values, U.S. allies, major clients in the government and commercial sectors, especially healthcare, their business model, of course, creating true value and focus on real products that, yes, can be intrusive and difficult, but transformative at the same time to how businesses operate securely. And that's, of course, adding AI as well. And that's fine if you disagree. Everyone values not only the quantitative factors, which we can all see differently, but when you add those qualitative ones, that's when there's never going to be no two alike. So in regards to the volatility as a long-term shareholder, who dollar cost average and happy with that position of a little over 5,000 shares, I've disclosed this many times before, this is just expected to happen when it comes to companies in a space like AI First that draws a lot of interest in buying but also selling once things quiet down. And if I'm overall optimistic for the future of the company and have a position I'm happy with, then this is just noise and will happen again and again for many more quarters to come. So it's nothing new here after all these years. So in the positive direction, but also in the negative direction, this is just always going to happen. Honestly, it's easier just to not look at the price and only review fundamentals of the company. But someone making content, it can be kind of tricky, but I literally just cover the screen from seeing the price when I don't need to know it. 
However, this can be another story if you're starting or changing a position. Valuation does matter a lot, of course, and it's always going to be something that's personal to you. More here, in my opinion, and finding a point where you're comfortable here. And no one can answer that for you except yourself. But honestly, for most investors, it is much easier on the psychological side, at least doing the dollar cost averaging game because you're buying less when the price runs up and you're buying more shares when the price goes down. But still, this is still tricky when you take your whole risk profile into perspective. Just because you can buy individual stocks doesn't mean you should. What are your debts, obligations, risks like medical expenses, cash buffers, all those things? Is your job something that's stable? This all actually plays a role into a retail investor and if they'll actually be able to invest or if it's going to be comfortable for them because it's going to increase the risk, not only if the investment itself, but their personal situation. And this will never be exactly the same between two different people. But long story short. It's just another week, and considering basically zero bankruptcy risk, of course, for Palantir, this will continue to trade in markets, and we'll see quiet times, we'll see volatile times like this, where they go very fast up the leading weeks, but also coming back down. And even though it's at $15 a share, just remember for those who were back in 2022, you were actually half the price, around $7. I wouldn't be surprised to see any more price action, of course, in either direction, but we'll just have to see. Hi everyone, it's Zach with Palantir Research. We just went through a tumultuous week here if you've been watching the stock price closely for Palantir. I'll go over the news in the video over the week shortly, but my thoughts on this for the price at least are the same as always. It's noise as usual. Companies especially like Palantir that can gain a big following from a narrative like AI is prone to volatility. And everyone has their own thoughts on valuation from over to undervaluation, but even so, so we've seen all kinds of scenarios of staying overvalued and growing your financials into that valuation versus becoming undervalued and then the financials will speak louder. You never really know and this can actually fluctuate even within the same company and in a short amount of time. This will always be misaligned in my opinion for Palantir because of these narrative pulls. But long story short, it's just noise to me and I'm happy with the shares I have considering I've built out my position. So the week now for the news where Palantir is standing out is with the smaller stuff. I don't make videos on this, so I'll briefly touch on those, but I'll also touch on the things that I made videos on as well for those who missed them. So always, I like to start out with Ether Square because he's really great at finding news that interests me myself the most since it's about potential clients and things that we don't really know about. We've got a couple posts, the first one here from last Sunday, August 13, pointing out that Mas Movil, which is the owner of Yoigo and Pepe Phone, I believe, is using Palantir Foundry. Ether Square is from Spain, and so he probably has a lot more familiarity with these, but that's a 15 million user base for a telecommunications company in that region. They're around a $3.5 billion market cap, so the typical large client for Palantir, especially for Foundry, companies that are managing so many data points, can really leverage Palantir's products. The second link from EtherSquare is Decra, which is a German company of around 50,000 employees. As you can see from the theme of the two players, they are international commercial organizations or non-government, which can always become a bright spot for Palantir in the future, even if international right now, especially on the commercial side, has been slogging behind. The adoption of Palantir may just be a little bit difficult, of course, with their reputation or just not being known as well. And of course, the use of domestic products over international, considering it's a U.S. product. But planting the seeds is important, especially commercially. So hopefully that's a turning point eventually in some time. Another news point is Joe Lonsdale did an interview with a very early engineer, Bob McGrew from Palantir, who was there for 10 years. Please note, the main focus of the interview is his role at OpenAI and the work there and thoughts around artificial intelligence. But getting an idea of the mindset of the people who worked at Palantir pre-DPO is always interesting to me as an investor because the culture appears to still be entrenched very strongly in the organization of being product and solution focused. Obviously, there's the pros and cons. We've seen this. I made a video also on the sales being hurt. But the most important part was that he was part of Palantir's journey and it kind of formed who they are today. So next, I made a couple brief videos on this that institutional activity is slowly creeping up. So check that out for more details. There's a couple videos, one specifically on Asian institutions, but also in general. In the latter video, I did compare the two data points since there was some time between them being made. And the trend right now is in the positive direction with more net buying than selling. I point out some big jumps like Morgan Stanley increasing their shares by 56%. But always note of warning for 13F filings, that data is delayed, showing quarterly activity for institutions. So it's always an interesting big picture kind of metric and something to watch over time, but it's not as actionable for me personally. 
So other quick highlights from the week also that I've covered in videos, Palantir also was mentioned in Forbes as a business benefiting from the war in Ukraine. They also mentioned we're being a guest for the upcoming AI Safety Summit. So these are just quick points that Palantir is slowly getting their media attention away from maybe the Peter Thiel spy company narrative, but hopefully it still creates better entry points for potential audiences in the future that are relatively neutral, even though they're not completely unbiased against Palantir. And lastly, my latest video around Palantir right now is that this talks about the culture of Palantir still around sales being kind of weak. I've actually covered this before months ago, but was curious on things have changed or if any new points are being provided by employees on their pros and cons of working at the company. What prompted this actually was Palantir Xing or tweeting out their very low acceptance rate of 0.7%. And that's very small compared to even Ivy League institutions that they use as an example. Essentially, I think they're trying to hire the best and brightest, and maybe they're trying to egg them on maybe or motivate some folks to apply for the reputational part of it. It's almost as if they're posing it as a challenge to show if you can get into Palantir or at least get an offer, you're the cream of the crop, right? So it might be playing at the ego of these kind of high performing individuals, but you never know. It might really work out. You can try to appeal to them this way. Hey everyone, it's Zach with Palantir Research. Palantir had a volatile week appearing to create some sort of baseline around $14 and then trying to break out towards 16 when Nvidia's earnings came out, but ultimately coming back down to 14 and testing that area once again for investors. So it's always interesting to see this short term volatility, but as long term investors, this is the kind of volatility you'd expect with a company like Palantir. So let's actually just talk about the weekly news for Palantir and the major factors. So what was that? Nvidia's earnings first, which I covered in a video, basically told me that the AI market and the need for compute continues to be bullish. Now, if you look at the stock and the short term reaction, of course, you wouldn't think that, but just read through Nvidia's earnings report and you'd be quite impressed actually with the numbers and growth there. Now, what I think is more important is Jerome Powell continues to be hawkish. Now, the market has some expectations of rates staying the same or even starting to go down sometime in 2024. We are in August 2023 and Jerome Powell continues to say inflation is too high and expects to increase rates. So I'm not going to speculate what will actually happen with rates. Honestly, things can change in an instant. But as Palantir investors, rates really do dictate on a large scale how stock markets are going to react because of valuation purposes and risk-free returns that are competing with any investment, not just Palantir. But also for the actual businesses or potential customers of Palantir, if money is expensive to borrow or cash can get a better return that's at least easier to sit in treasuries, at least it's risk-free, then money flowing to potential investments, especially for more early adoption technology like AI, in general, is not just Palantir's products, of course, then it stifles the growth in that market, at least in the short term or for a little longer. So companies spend less or they'll delay spending while they can, which Palantir can try to offset for now by doing these trial periods and adopting them. But still, this can hurt revenue growth over time. We'll have to see, of course, how this all turns out. Now, what else happened for Palantir this week? Well, the other news story I covered was Palantir being a participant in Dallow, which for the Denmark market is basically a way to showcase defense companies. So I still remain very optimistic for Palantir to continue penetrating the international government market in Europe, at least for those related to NATO. We may not see it in the short term, but over the next decade, I would not be surprised to see Palantir as the main beneficiary to rising geopolitical tensions against Russia and China. Then we also had Shyam Sankar and X welcome Calypso AI to the FedStart family. So I know there have been coverage there that could be potential competitors or overlap with Palantir and what they do, which is also covered in that video. I'm not saying to ignore the small competition at least, but they are still establishing themselves as a guardrail play for artificial intelligence. And of course, Palantir's AIP does talk about guardrails as well. And either way, they are going through Palantir, which kind of gives them a piece of the action anyways on if Calypso is very successful on the government front here because they're going through the Fed Start program. So it'll be interesting to see how that all turns out. I know it's still really early for that company. And last but not least, my last video right before was on the NHS and how the NHS England Trust is going to be doing a communication plan around their Federated Data Platform, or FDP, and of course that contract's for £480 million and possibly expected to be awarded later in September. So for a long time, silence or snippets of information has been the status quo from the NHS. While ignoring all the foxglove and open democracy kind of FUD about Palantir and being a spy company trying to destroy the NHS, which in my opinion doesn't make sense because they want the NHS to thrive because how are you going to get paid? 
But I digress. More to look out to see if this actually changes public opinion of real people, but I think it's a good sign in a fair procurement process at least. You shouldn't be trying to sway public opinion so openly, of course, early in the process to have solutions speak for themselves. So if they're willing to talk about it now, I think it's actually a good sign for Palantir possibly getting the deal because they're willing to talk about it now. Hey everyone, it's Zach with Palantir Research. Big volatile week for Palantir with a big new customer link revealed by EtherSquare where there may be some obvious motivations for them to try out Palantir. New competition coming up from ChatGPT for Enterprises with also Kathy Wood buying some shares on the fast drop on Thursday that took place and all the analyst coverage I went over this week as well. So looking at where we landed first for Palantir's price on the week, we started in the $14, flew quickly up almost to the mid-16s on Wednesday, and dropping immediately very fast the next day on Thursday, hover around that $14, $15 borderline territory today. So Friday was much more tame. A lot of this movement seemed to be driven by the major analyst ratings and price targets that came out. I put out videos going into each of them on more detail, of course, for their reasoning, but basically Bank of America's Mariana reiterated their buy rating and their price target of $18. They point out the major future catalysts are the S&P eligibility, potential to win the NHS contract, and being a secure AI play for businesses to implement LLMs. Now, what's funny to me, for Morgan Stanley in my video, I went over how they downgraded their rating from equal weight to underweight and raised their price target from $8 to $9, but they also cite the same catalyst as Bank of America, but believe those are more sell the news events or already priced in. So with AIP struggling, at least in their perspective, to gain traction on the monetization front. So we'll see who's right later on. And also, for some reason, the internet appears to be tying Morgan Stanley, buying last quarter in their 13F, with the downgrade coming out saying they are trying to manipulate the market. All I can say is that these banks are huge organizations, 13F data is delayed, and they can't even guarantee what they do will even affect the market in the short term. So we never really know what they're doing in the present time and their motivations, and the person in charge of these investments may have different goals and criteria than the person in charge of the analysts making the ratings, so I'll leave it up to you. Now, who is the big customer revealed by Ether Square with some links? It is Avantor. They're a big materials distributor and manufacturer for products that deal with you know, health and biopharma, education, things like that. And they have a $14 billion market cap with a worldwide presence. So they've got many major brands under them, and they supply a lot of their chemicals and biopharma supplies to manufacturers who are producing drugs, to name one example. Now, something interesting about Aventor is that they have experienced an 8.7 decrease in their last quarterly revenue metric, where they have a 9.1 actually de decrease in organic revenue growth before any foreign exchange impacts. Now, that's just my speculation. But by investing in themselves as a large company to streamline more efficiency is one thing. But additionally, if they're able to find more ways to drive revenue growth with Palantir Foundry and find ways to increase this growth back up without any pandemic boost, then hopefully the value shows and they continue to expand usage of Palantir. We'll just have to see. And the second new link just revealed is Congra Foods. They hold major food brands that are very recognizable. A lot of you would know like Snack Pack Pudding, Slim Jims, and Hunt's Ketchup to name a few. And they are also quite a big company at around $14 billion market cap, so similar to the last one. In their latest earnings, though, I did want to point out, even though they are still growing organically, and nothing crazy, though, considering the space they're in in food, they have recently seen a decrease in their margin, which can be an opportunity for Palantir, which is their bread and butter, in my opinion, if they're using Foundry, and that's just to increase their efficiency. So more to see if we get any official kind of updates or PRs from the company regarding these clients, but it's always nice to get this ahead of time when we get to see the links. At least we know they're trying them out. So thanks again to EtherSquare and check out his Substack if you're interested. He works really hard on these links and maintaining the dossier. I'll just cover what he shows publicly, of course, not to take any thunder. So check out his stuff if you like. Now, the other news from this week on that Thursday on the 8% drop, Kathy Wood actually scooped up more shares of Palantir, around 670,000 of them. I don't put too much weight, of course, for myself when ARK is buying or selling, but I know it is newsworthy, at least for those curious about potential big buyers of Palantir stock. And it's almost been a month since her last purchase back in early August, so it really looks like she wanted to take advantage of the price drop on that Thursday. And then last but not least, ChatGPT Enterprise. They announced on August 28th that they will be offering an enterprise-grade security and privacy version of ChatGPT, and that's going to be with higher speed for companies. So basically, they're trying to bank on employees of companies using ChatGPT and having their employer start paying instead of them using it individually and like the free plan or even in that uh, plus plan there for their product. Now, of course, this is for good reason, like security and privacy for peace of mind for these businesses. So I totally understand it and the value there. 
Now, I think this will be a great product, to be honest, because the context of how it can be used will continue to expand and grow the skills of these workforce to start adopting AI in general, which I think is good for Pounter's AIP product as well. Now, this is more of a quick product to bring into your organization, so it's quite scalable considering the recognizability already, but also its usage naturally intertwining with workers and what they're doing already. The downfall, though, is that it's not truly transformational like AIP, and that's not the purpose of the product. And that's logical, too, concerning it is not as invasive and not making you create an ontology of your data and fully unlock the potential there. That's just a whole other world. Like anything, it's just a trade-off between a luxury product and a mass appeal product. I think over time, companies may find themselves possibly adopting both AIP and ChatGPT Enterprise or some certain parts there. But for those earlier into AIP, this is my speculation, we'll find that they already have a full arsenal to leverage artificial intelligence and build those kind of apps on top more seamlessly, flexibly, and meaningfully in regards to tying that proprietary data they have, as well as their proprietary LLMs. But that remains to be seen, so hope in general this expands the AI market and recognizability for everyone to use it. So it'll be interesting to see what happens this following week and where the market is going leaning towards for Palantir, considering the volatility we just experienced this past week. Hey everyone, it's Zach with Palantir Research. We've got a jam-packed week of Palantir news. As you can see, I've made several videos already this week, but that's just the tip of the iceberg of everything happening around, like more Palantir links, insider selling, the Titan program, and possibly a new product or tool from Palantir's internal team called Witchcraft, as well as a Palantir senior policy advisor to Alex Karp, who did have an interview on CNBC giving their outlook on China and US and that relationship. So looking at the stock first, kind of the same old middle ground ending week here between between the 14s and 15, so nothing crazy at least. So what was all the news happening? So I'll briefly note the videos I posted this past week, but get onto the newer stuff as well. So first, there was a jump in short interest on the stock after trending down the last few months. Nothing crazy per se, so I'm not saying there'd be any chance of a short squeeze, but just something to note because it was a 13% jump from the previous short interest measurement or the number of shares being shorted against the outstanding float. So it's something I like to keep track of, but it's not necessarily an indicator of what's going to happen to the price. Next, Palantir had a PR regarding the availability of their Agora product now, which is going to track carbon emissions. The significance here is that it was actually originally developed for the refined metals industry, but that's going to be picked up by the energy sector now, and one of their notable first partners is BP. So there's going to be more to see where that lands later on, and I'm optimistic on its scalability across the globe. And in my video too, I do note that this is a possible monopoly at least because they're trying to create a standard here. So check that out if you're interested in those details. Then we have Alex Karp going around Eastern Europe. So first he spoke at Estonia's Tallinn summit, where he mostly talked about the government military business, of course, since that region's most pertinent there with the war in Ukraine and things happening in the region in general. While there, he also met with Estonia's prime minister, Kaja Kalas, and also Finland's defense minister, Antio Hakan. So forgive my pronunciation there for both of their names. But my thoughts overall is that NATO expansion is happening, of course, and it's one of the biggest opportunities this decade, as well as the modernization of the alliance and any of their defense anyways. So while geopolitical tensions are rising due to the war in Ukraine and Europe and Russia in general, there's also the Chinese aggression as well that we're going to be thinking about, and NATO is increasingly wanting to at least have some significance in that region as well. So more to see there, and I just hope to see that Palantir continues to spread and become almost a standard as well. And while this was all happening too, Palantir was getting press coverage for further legitimizing them as an AI player. And that's with joining Biden's commitments to safeguard AI technology alongside other big names as it's developed, while Alex Karp also being named on Time's 100 AI list. So even without these lists and recognition, us retail investors already know about this for Palantir, and it is a legitimate AI force and they're the products and having real impacts in the real world today with Ukraine, hospitals, and just general industry everywhere and improving everything. But it's always great to see this media attention finally helping to shore up their reputation and make it a little more official. It doesn't hurt to have some more name recognition out there and have customers think about Palantir in a positive light for the first time before even trying to hear all about those typical, oh, Donald Trump, Peter Thiel, spy company stuff here. So it's always great to have that kind of information out there floating for Palantir. And I just hope as an investor, it leads to actual sales. Next, we've got the announcement of AIP Con 2 and the keynote speakers. I did a whole video on this, so if you're interested in knowing a little bit more about the speakers and what they do and what they've already done with Palantir, so feel free to check that out. 
but mainly there's a lot of organizations using AIP in such a short amount of time, with over 100 of them as they've noted, and this was also on the earnings call as well recently. And 30 of them actually are presenting, um, so it's not the keynote speakers necessarily, but also running workshops on how they're using AIP. And there are big names in there, like the New York Stock Exchange, Intuit, so if you get your taxes done, Sampo Japan, of course, which is great to see an international client. So that's just to name a few, and I'm excited to see that there. I'll probably create follow-up videos for that as well next week once the event goes on. And then we also got a new partnership announced with not only is it in healthcare, but is international. It's in Italy with a university research hospital called Policlinico Gemelli, and they are the largest hospital in Rome and will be using artificial intelligence to go through their vast amounts of data and improve clinical outcomes, drug discovery, as well as overall improving their telehealth services. So I hope to see more expansion here over time. You already know about my biases towards the healthcare industry. It's what I work in now, but I see it as the next big opportunity for Palantir to become a standard or monopolize some sort of function that a lot of these health services are doing and tying it all together. So not just hospitals, but also with the medical supplies as well as the pharma site that we're seeing. Now onto the littler news that I haven't made videos on. We've got a new link from Ethersquare showing connections to Ariva Pharma. They make generics, but also cancer drugs. It's just more evidence of Palantir getting deeper into the drug discovery that I just mentioned in pharmaceutical industry. So it's maybe a sign that they can become a standard as well in the future and more to look out for that. Now, insider selling wise, we got a small sale from a director, Alexander Moore. I'm just bringing it up so investors like yourselves can know about it and see these kind of SEC filing yourselves. And they're not all the doom and gloom that articles may bring it up to be. In this case, it was actually a very small pre-planned trading schedule. So it's not like he sold it out of nowhere. And plus, it was only around 22,000 shares at the $15 range. And after all is said and done, it's really nothing because his position remaining is still over 1.7 million shares. So it's not a big deal deal in my eyes. Now, on the Titan program, this is big. This has been going on for a while where Palantir and Raytheon are competing for all or some of this large contract. Basically, it's a nothing sandwich right now, but there was a reminder kind of article for folks and people have been talking about as well on YouTube that this can be awarded probably before the end of the year. So if Palantir wins some or all of this contract, that will be a major step forward for them in the government business in the United States. It'll be huge because it'll be for modernizing the armed forces and basically being a transformative project that will be highly paid. So hopefully there's a good outcome here. I would like them to win the majority of the contract and beat out Raytheon, but if they have to share, it's still better than nothing. We do know they're a top contender here since they're going through that trial basis for that smaller contract previously. And then next we got two blog posts from Shyam Sankar. They are longer reads here and a lot more detailed jargon in there, so it's just a warning. But I do recommend that people read this Essentially, it's about their government business, their history, philosophy, and the overall progress around the products they've developed over time, and of course, their value to give manageable security controls and automation to truly have a good product here. And this, of course, can be for the government to trust them. Now, the big kicker from this is in the coming soon section in the second blog post. They reveal that they'll be making one of their internal products called Witchcraft available open source. What that sounds like to me is that there's a possibility they want to make this a product because it also says they are seamless with Apollo and with FedStar. So government-wise, it sounds like a win-win where Palantir can show off the things they've been doing in the background and impressing the folks who actually use this tool to start integrating it. It also reminds me of Apollo because that was also previously an internal tool. It just makes me excited to know there's probably a lot more under the hood at Palantir than any of us would know or even the customers know about, considering this was something internal that they use for themselves. So more to see as we get some progress on that. And then on CNBC, Jacob Helberg, who was a senior policy advisor to Alice Karp did a CNBC interview on the whole China situation around banning iPhones for government employees to retaliate against the American restrictions as well on the Huawei chip situation. And being a policy advisor for Palantir, I believe this is a reflection on the kind of outlook Palantir is naturally going to have as well, growing with the tensions with China and the AI race. I mean, they said he is a policy advisor to the CEO. So in turn, this affects the business decisions that Palantir is making and have been making for quite some time, honestly. And we know they won't do business with adversarial countries, of course, like Russia and China, because they strongly believe their technology needs to stay out of their hands. 
I think it will be increasingly essential for U.S. companies to choose a side like Palantir or else they'll have to deal with the real risks of dealing with China and having to cave in to certain demands or kind of changes or just lose money, which will disappoint investors. I know it puts them in a very hard place because it's such a big opportunity, but it's not a new narrative here. And it always seems to be the boogeyman that China is always around the corner to topple the U.S. And there's a lot of side effects that happen to businesses that get caught in the crosshairs. But these emerging technologies are important, and it gives the U.S. as well as China a chance to militarily pull ahead as AI is leveraged. So more to see as well there. Hi everyone, it's Zach with Palantir Research. We've got more huge Ethersquare customer links, with one being the most valuable company in the world, but also alongside Lord Grimm, who's also a great researcher for other Palantir clients. Then, we've also got General Milley basically talking up Palantir, clearing the fog of war in Ukraine, and also the AI summit here in the US and all the so cool pictures of Alex Karp and Elon Musk happily next to each other. So that's the new stuff I haven't covered yet. So looking at the stock first, we are still stuck in between the $14 to $16 range. I know Friday was a little volatile for those dropping down to the low 15s, but for context, it really isn't a big variance from what we've been seeing recently in the past few weeks. So we'll see how next week turns out. So what was all the news happening this week? I'll briefly note the videos I already posted this past week and close out on the newer stuff. So first, we've got an interview with Palantir's Senior Director of Enterprise Technology, Marcus Loeffler, at the DLD AI Summit. Notably, he was at a well-known consulting firm, McKinsey, for 20 years and actually reached senior partner. So he's a high performer in a corporate environment. And at this interview, most notably, he talked about how Palantir has saved the World Food Program's $50 million. And he noted the importance of them saving this, of course, being able to reinvest that savings over time or to be used elsewhere more effectively. So fascinatingly, his example of AI changing the world was it being used to analyze and predict weather patterns because that can output the expected crop yields, meaning they can better plan which regions will have a higher food demand. Overall, a strong interview and always great to hear quantitative results. And I did shout out Arnie in the video there posting it, but also wanted to give credit to Lord Grimm who originally found the interview who it's actually in the description. So feel free to follow him for more Palantir content as well on X. So next, Palantir won a new deal with Babcock, an international commercial client in the defense space. And more notably, they do a lot of business with the UK and their government and have been working on large contracts with their naval fleet. Essentially, this AIP deal is another way for Palantir to continue building up their connections to the Ministry of Defense directly, but with their other contracts and suppliers as such as Babcock. So I'm hoping this is an early step to more deals in the future, especially since this is an AIP international commercial deal. Next, we've got the major news of the week, which is AIP Con 2. And remember, each of the keynote speakers made sure to focus on a different value aspect to capture as much as possible for the audience to see the value of Palantir. There was a red flag for investors taking note there of the shortening of the five-year lead mentioned by Alex Karp that the competition, you know, using LLMs have accelerated their pace of the competition to get closer to Palantir. At least they admitted it here. AIP still appears to be taking off with 40 new clients signing up in the last two weeks, which is very impressive considering their type of clients, which are larger organizations. But the major point for all investors to know is that Shyam Sankar focused on KLLMs, making sure to note that multiple LLMs can work in coordination with building a consensus on something or utilizing multiple ones for different aspects to tackle a problem. Then also, when Ted Mabry spoke, he focused on the widespread adoption of AIP across so many customers and industries and use cases and introduced their AIP bootcamp, which is promising to take a problem to minimum viable product or MVP in just five days. That's super fast. Now, honestly, this is major news to me personally, where they can accelerate new customers to become more familiar with this new technology that can also speed up expansion within these organizations since they're basically building a template to tackle other problems as well in use cases outside of the boot camp. So once that gets started for these corporate environments, they'll be able to spread it out much more quickly. And of course, the speakers that are coming next, Eaton went first and they went over their issue with the material shortage. Their focus was on Palantir's AIP ability to use KLLMs, ensuring they can use multiple ones to tackle any issue. 
But next we had CPKC focus on their train cart dwell issue where an analyst was able to leverage LLMs to coordinate and get a full picture of their actions on the whole train system. And then they highlighted the continuous improvement and ability of Palantir's system to build up its knowledge base over time as more use cases get involved. Essentially, you're not starting from square one all the time. Next is Centra, who is tackling scenario identification with their sensors on a specific tollway. They highlighted the value of trying and tying together proprietary data alongside third-party data to get the full real-time picture there in a secure manner. And then lastly was HCA Healthcare who continued to expand their nursing scheduling and showed how they automated it from just the alert of the issue all the way to fixing it and contacting the nurses to actually cover the shift. And it looped back into the system, making it self-reinforcing. Then they also automated their shift handoff process from a piece of paper, literally showed that, to a living, breathing report that can be built through chat. And they ensured to highlight Palantir's security, auditability, and trackability, which is needed for healthcare and other highly regulated industries. Then my latest video was on HSBC's analyst, Stephen Bercy. They initiated their rating at Palantir at a hold while putting together a price target of $16. Essentially, HSBC's institutional ownership appears consistent with their analyst rating, and they strategically released this after AIPCon, which made it look like they're not sure where the price is really going to go, which is $16 right now for the price target, which is actually in that middle range that we've talked about when I talked about the price just now. We'll see who ends up right in the end, but right now this rating isn't grabbing too much attention like the low Morgan Stanley one versus the higher bank of America with Mariana and Wedbush's Dan Ives. Now to the new stuff. We've got General Milley in an article talking about the fog of war in Ukraine getting lifted. If you read it, Palantir is not named specifically, but everyone knows it's about that, and they pointed out the technology in the background picture there. And Ted Mabry himself at AIBCon did this. So basically, this article is about Palantir, and that's confirmed. But this is always great to see, continue to see how Palantir is making a difference in Ukraine and continues to build up their credibility and reputation in the European region as a whole, at least for their government military business. Next, we have an EtherSquare link. Klokner Metal is around a 750 million euro market cap company with around 7,700 employees and 100,000 customers. So they already do billions in sales and around 140 million euros of net income, at least what's disclosed in 2019 and on their About Us page. So if you just go to their latest Q2 2023 earnings report, it highlights that they did about 131 million euros of EBITDA with 96 million euros of positive operating cash flow. And they are guiding for full year 2023 between 220 to 280 million euros of EBITDA with higher cash flow. So we'll see if this ever gets publicly disclosed, but either way, if Palantir is truly helping them, there's definitely a piece of the pie here where their contract could be worth millions per year. Then another EtherSquare link here showing Saudi Aramco. This is major news here if it goes official, considering we all know they are an oil company, and I say in quotes for the Saudis government, but yes, they are technically an $8 trillion company based on their stock today. For that size of their company and being in the oil industry, it makes complete sense for them to try out Palantir, and of course they have that expertise built up with BP. Now, if they can expand with an organization as prominent and large as them, then the potential revenue is huge. Now, I do want to bring a warning here, and this is going to be a point of contention. Some of you may bring up the government being an issue, and I understand possible concerns there, especially around their human rights issues. But technically, they are a Western ally to an extent, and militarily, they are still a major asset to the United States and the West and the region. So I'll leave it up to them to decide since it's not cut and dry. But as an investor, I'm still comfortable overall with this relationship. And then the other big kicker here related is with all the great research from Lord Grimm on Abu Dhabi's investment authority. I won't steal his thunder here, so follow and check out his X account and read through this whole thread. But he did extensive research here and found many employees who are literally saying they use Foundry right on their LinkedIn. And of course, this would be another major customer in that Middle Eastern region here that can scale into huge revenue in the future. But like any of these countries, we are skirting that gray area on Western values. So more to see how this actually turns out in the end. And then lastly, we have the AI regulation gathering here from corporate leaders, including Elon Musk and Alex Karp, notably. 
It was a big deal on the internet, of course, with them sitting together with these great pictures of them laughing and smiling. Of course, this prompted some half-hearted rumors of them working together or wanting that or having a business deal. But in my opinion, I don't see that happening anytime soon, at least, concerning Elon's vertical integration over time, at least with Tesla, which most likely includes building out their own artificial intelligence capabilities specific to Tesla only. But it doesn't mean they can't be friendly nor have previous employees exchange in between, concerning both of them have top-notch workers there and the propensities to have very intense work environments. Hey everyone, it's Zach with Palantir Research. We've got alleged fraud at a major Palantir client with their president even stepping down, and then also losing a government client out in France, and then augmented reality confirmed for Palantir, Kathy Wood buying up a bunch of shares, and analyst ratings after AIP Con maintaining them. And there's plenty more that happened this week, so let's get into it. But first, looking at the stock. We closed right above $14. This is pretty much the bottom range that we've been seeing the past months and actually touched into the $13 territory on Thursday. A lot of the downward pressure, on my opinion, was driven by the Fed. Even though rates were not hiked, the digestion of the market seems to be more accepting that rates will stay high for longer. But we'll see what happens there. So what was all the news happening this week? And I'll briefly note the videos I already posted this past week and close out on the newer stuff. So first, we've got that loss of an international government client. The DGSI is the internal security body of France who last renewed their Palantir contract back in 2019 for around 10 million euros. Now, they've decided to run out of the rest of their contract and are aiming to implement their new homegrown solution first, built by Chapvision by the Paris Olympics, which is summer of 2024. So that's coming pretty quick. The article states the French government has been checking in quarterly to ensure the new solution meets their requirements, but it's important to note this decision was brewing for a long time years in the making, where they've been publicly decrying Palantir themselves, trying to get away and move towards a homegrown solution. So we'll see if anything changes, but I'm assuming this business is gone already for now and wish them the best of luck with their own domestic solution, even though I'm not really sure what's going to turn out. Next, we have the two bullish analyst rating being maintained, which is important to note happened after AIP Con. Dan Ives from Wedbush keeps his buy rating and $25 price target, with Mariana Perez Mora from Bank of America also keeping her buy rating with a $18 price target. So although there was no increase in these targets here, taking place after AIP Con shows that they did not see any red flags from AIP Con that warranted any weaknesses or changes in their ratings and price targets, so that's a good thing. The common themes, though, are that Palantir's strategy appears to show the clues that it is working and that clients are growing from AIP as well as the sophistication of the use cases being shown should spur more demand as competitors need to implement AI just to play at the same level of these clients. Now, these two are obviously on the higher end of the spectrum compared to other analyst ratings, so just keep that in mind there. Then we've got Palantir stepping up their media presence to their U.S. government business, but also a sneak peek into their augmented reality tech. So Jacob Helberg, the senior policy advisor to the CEO Alex Karp, spoke on Fox News first regarding U.S.-China relations. Shyam Sankar released a proposal to deter China and the DoD to stir up competition as buyers. And then Alex Karp spoke to CNBC and Fox Business again at the Software for Government. So all of these are consistently on message honestly for the company from everyone. And the main focus of everything is deterring Chinese aggression by having military superiority from the U.S. And to achieve this, everyone notes that the United States is ahead of the whole world when it comes to artificial intelligence, meaning we need to develop this with the right guardrails and legislation in a responsible manner. So the risks of China closing in on our technology lead is very real, but it requires that U.S. to bring together tech and policymakers to create that framework that allows the safe development of artificial intelligence. Alongside this, Shyam Sankar's article focuses on pushing the DoD to be more innovative and spurring competition amongst themselves as buyers, where he referred ballistic missiles being developed by these separate military branches before, which eventually led to the higher performing products pull forward while scaling back those poor performers, and rightly so. If this proposal actually does make a difference over time or gets implemented, we shall see. And for Alex Karp's interviews, he performed very well, I think, in my opinion, and, he, and I think he seems to do much better at these news interviews than I think for like AIP Con, for example, at least from the investor standpoint. He's really focused on the questions and answers in a positive light for the company while being relaxed and not as uptight as a typical CEO would be in these interviews. So he does come off as very real. Either way, Ukraine has been a great talking point for them to show how valuable Palantir has been during their Fox Business interview. As well as on CNBC, he spreads word on how high demand is for AIP and they are seeing radical growth for the United States, albeit Europe is much slower. So with all this media presence for Palantir, 
announcer this week and hope to see more of this kind of positive PR in the future some more. It is going to get the word out there and just get basic name recognition for them. Then we also got a new deal with CAZ Investments, who is a Houston-based asset manager. That's with $4 billion under management, so it's not that big, but it is a long deal at five years. So I'm thinking they've already built up the use cases and value, and we're already convinced to stick with Poundtier for so long. We'll see how they perform over time and hope they stay around as a client much longer in the future. But notably, I wanted to point out that they are an asset manager, so we don't hear about these kind of partnerships too much from Poundtier, but we know that these kind of clients are coming to them. And then we got Arnie, who got a snippet from the S4G conference that teased that mixed reality headset that we've seen in the background of Alex Karp's CNBC interview. This will be a great way for end users to understand how Palantir ties data together and makes it a visual tool for operators. Now, for my own speculations wise, as a warning, this could be an early step into consumer applications for Palantir, but I wouldn't bank on them focusing on that yet. Now, while the technology is still being teased out for the government clients. So who knows, maybe far in the future. But what I think would be closer is that commercial application of virtual training for surgeons per se running simulations, or maybe factory workers training on items. And of course, this is before they use the physical ones or oil rigs, which is a very dangerous job. Either way, I could see lots of applications here. Basically, you want to lower the stakes during training as much as possible until you have to practice on the real thing and do the on-site work just to be as safe as possible and even be as efficient with money. So either way, cool insight into the future. Now onto the newest stuff, Kathy Wood scooped up more shares on Thursday when the market dropped as fast as 7% into the 13s, but closed the day right at $14 a share. So I'm assuming she's buying around that area. She purchased a little over a million shares over a few funds. So these past few months though, she's been buying up shares on these quick downturn days. It probably adds some stability considering we see these large swings down and we see large buyers swooping in. Now to know if that will continue, that's another story. But just from my anecdotal observations, we can take a look at Ark's journey across their funds of accumulating and selling off their Palantir shares and restarting their position here. When Palantir DPO'd, it didn't take long for Ark to start dipping their toes into the shares, but really ramped up during the price surge as well throughout 2021. But as we all know, in 2022, this all changed inside of the slowing government business and that changed thinking that there wouldn't be as many sole source contracts. And then the risk off rewards to them was not that good, meaning they just thought there were better opportunities. And this was spoken by Brett Winton from ARC and he did an interview with Meet Kevin there. So things can change. But for now, it looks like ARC is still in accumulation mode. Amit had a great video that covers this subject, so please check that out. Basically, they see government as a bright spot again and are optimistic on the artificial intelligence platform for Palantir. And I'm not going to behold myself, of course, to their thesis, but it's always interesting to see who else is buying Palantir. Next, Palantir gets a shout out on a Tampa Bay General article here, being recognized as one of the best smart hospitals for 2024. They mention all their tech initiatives to make them a more high-tech hospital, and Palantir gets a little bit of the spotlight alongside GE Healthcare. They don't get in too much specifics here, but it's still nice to see them get a mention and having being pivotal to their augmentation for their technical capabilities. More and more of these little PRs do add up over time and will expose more commercial folks to the good work that Palantir is doing, especially in the healthcare field. Then, Palantir posted their Cone Health Master Class, where it's about leadership adopting technology like Palantir and transforming their healthcare organizations. It's a long one here at about 14 minutes, and it's meant for leadership, honestly, on how to get through that friction of adoption of a product. So it's very invasive, and of course, Palantir is a good example of that. And Cone Health was listed as a workshop presenter too for the AIP Con. So it's nice that they may have touched on this a little bit as well with other clients in person there. So we hope to see more tangible results, of course, in the future if they ever want to present. Now, the most unfortunate news for Palantir is the fraud scandal with one of their clients popping up this month that ended up with Sampo's president resigning. The perpetrator, though, was Big Motor, who is a widespread used car dealer in Japan. They do repairs and stuff that experienced immense growth the last few years. But basically, there's been evidence leak where they've alleged be overcharging customers with work they don't even do, like an oil change and just don't do it, or even damaging vehicles themselves or making the damage even worse because it was already going to be billed to the auto insurance companies, aka Sompo, which they can get more money from. And you'd think Sompo wouldn't want this to happen and pay more out for these. But in the end, they st with this passing on the fraudulent claims, Big Motor was pushing Sompo's auto insurance plans over other competitors because of this acceptance too. And this chain reaction kept going. So during an investigation with Sompo, they found no systematic fraud in the final report and they obviously approved it and due to their interest in keeping Big Motor valuable. 
but this ended up backfiring on them where the other major auto insurance companies audited them the same way and easily found these fraudulent claims being widespread over half of them, which led to Big Motor's leadership resigning as well as Sampo's president, admitting he was still doing business with Big Motor, even knowing that this fraud was going on. And this is still a developing story, of course, and what I'm saying is mostly alleged, but this was why they did not attend AIP Con for those who were wondering. And Japan's equivalent of the SEC, the Financial Services Agency, is still monitoring them. As I mentioned, this is still a developing story. Now, in regards to being a customer of Palantir, this goes to show that it's how you use the technology and products. Now, it sucks for sure, and any adverse effects onto Sunpo's financials will affect their possible revenue to Palantir, but it doesn't sound like Palantir's products were responsible for missing the fraud or underperforming, but rather allegedly ignoring it on purpose for the sake of their own profit. So there's a difference there. So it's not necessarily bad for Palantir and their products, to be honest, but it still sucks for them considering they are a major partner in Japan and of course losing that trust with the public. Hey everyone, it's Zach with Palantir Research. Another huge week of news for Palantir with hundreds of millions of dollars in new business as well as partnerships and more important news. So looking at the stock first, we had a tumultuous week upwards ending the five-day period up 14% on Friday. The stock flew as high as $16.81 but came all the way back down to close the week right at $16 on the dot. Now, nothing new here, but it'll be interesting to see if we can break through the 16s into 17s as the price action seems to be resisting around this area. And I've always talked about the last few weeks that it's been hovering between this area as well as down to the 14s. Now, if we were to fall back down there, it wouldn't be a surprise to me seeing that as the stock has been fluctuating in this zone already. So what was all the news happening this week? And I'll briefly note the videos I already posted this past week and close out on the newer stuff that I didn't cover. So starting with Bank of America giving their thoughts while reiterating their $18 price target and buy rating again. Palantir had a busy media parade the week prior and at the S4G Summit, which Bank of America was able to attend, so they were able to share those insights. I had a whole video going through the long document, but essentially the major points are that defense is a bright spot for Palantir. The S4G Summit itself was attended by around 300 public and private sector attendants, while they say that the DoD has fewer choices or even having only Palantir as a choice for some of their solutions as well, and as the ability to bring the silos together of the different military branches. So they really like Palantir. In addition, the summit showed off plenty of use cases that shows how malleable Palantir is as a product from nuclear security all the way to drones. Plus, more forward-looking Bank of America notes Palantir's strategy for PGWS, or Palantir Government Web Services, which is the umbrella for Apollo, FedStart, and Ontology Software Development Kit. These products are working in tandem or individually to meet the current and potential clients needed to take on government contracts quickly. And then Witchcraft 2, they also noted, is an upcoming open source tool that was previously only internal at Palantir that streamlined security and authentication controls. So check out that video for more details. Then, the massive contract locked up for three years is the $250 million one for the Army. The best part is that it's specifically specified as a machine learning and artificial intelligence research and development one. So being able to cook in and develop their products more with the military alongside them, which they've already been doing for years, but now specifically for Palantir to do this kind of research for three years is hopefully going to lead to more business in the future, as well as have them improve their product much better. Next, we had a partnership or collaboration announced with one of Palantir's subsidiaries. This is an artificial intelligence play in the healthcare space, where Centropy, which was a joint venture founded by Merck and Palantir together back in 2018, is partnering with Avidium. The main deal here is that Palantir's continue to build up their network effects all around healthcare at different angles to ensure they start to connect the industry, but in a secure manner. And that was the main focus of that press release. And then deal-wise, on the federal government's procurement database, we saw the National Institute of Health, NIH, signed another $60 million contract over three years. So there's not really any details here or press releases or anything in the news, but it's always nice to see a government healthcare related deal because it's the industry we want Palantir to continue to scale in quickly, and they've been demonstrating already, but also the stickiness and consistency of these government contracts are very attractive. Then, Thursday, we had an action-packed day. It was the day we were expecting some news or inkling on the NHS FDP contract, saying it was planned for the 28th to be awarded. Now, no one knew if that was for sure going to happen, but unfortunately, no news yet on who won it. But as a surprising piece of news, especially because of the timing of it, 
Foxglove, whom most of you know as that annoying account constantly posting articles and tweeting on how Palantir is a spy company and is going to steal your data. Of course, they're just making that up. They also exaggerate in their articles any negativity when it comes to Palantir, but they publicly release that they're going away for now. And speculating, we can think of many reasons, but the timing is impeccable of it, and it could be a good thing if they failed in their fight, but it also could be a bad thing if they think they've accomplished their goal here. We'll see with time and see who actually wins the contract. And in addition to that information on Friday, we found out that the FD P award announcement at the moment is going to be delayed until mid-October, so that's a few weeks from now. The UK will be running a campaign to engage the public, so hopefully it will help whoever wins get the buy-in from everybody, including patients and doctors and the like, but optimistically, we'd like it to be Palantir, of course. The campaign is for around £2 million, and a month ago, I actually made a video about them wanting to do this to ensure that the public is aware of the FDP and how their data will be secured and who's handling it. Interesting to see what's going to actually turn out in the end. But also, Shyam Sanker had an hour-long podcast with Kathy Wood and the ARK Invest team. It was a great resource and it's an awesome video to watch, so I definitely recommend you to check it out for getting more insight from someone who's been there for so long. And there are numerous highlights, but I think a lot of investors resonated with the clarification of Palantir being seen as a consultancy and Shyam's perspective on that. But nothing new there for those who follow that closely on forward deployed engineers who help them build real solutions to real problems that you can scale over time. And that's because they were on the ground floor with these end users. But another cool question too with the AIP product and talking about how artificial intelligence is changing the world. And they asked, does Palantir use this stuff themselves? And Shyam confirmed this is the case. So they are pushing themselves not only selling the next frontier of technology with artificial intelligence, but they're also using it to hyperscale themselves up as well. And Joe Lonsdale, a Palantir co-founder, also had a short article about his 8VC fund working with Japan to up their defense industry and getting into startups there. Now, nothing is tied directly to Palantir besides his association, but with the recent Sompo scandal and the ever ongoing aggression by China, Japan seems to be a ripe government client when it comes to the military and the defense sector. And a lot of the points he states are related to Palantir when it comes to having an aligned mission and working with drones and autonomous ship warfare, just like in Ukraine. And that's already been demonstrated. So it is still my speculation, but I can see this as a little inkling that Palantir wants to start diversifying their reliance on Sompo on that commercial side of business in the east and hopefully can succeed in landing some military business in Japan alongside their government. Now, what I haven't made videos on here, Palantir had a nice video on HCA Healthcare on what they've been using Palantir for with their staffing. I like the AIP con presentations a little bit, but preferring to these videos for clients are a lot more cleaner and engaging since they, of course, refine them. So check it out if you have a chance here. It's just good to have it available for prospective clients to go check it on YouTube and make it very available. Then Palantir also posted one of the other speakers from the S4G or Software for Government Summit event where a lot of the attendees from the public and private center got together and were showcased Palantir. So check out the video there, but essentially it shows the government's use case of Palantir and how they were using technology to stay up to date, of course, around the COVID time. The example focused on COVID vaccines and the whole logistics there around that and the issues they had to solve and to do it very quickly. And basically, long story short, Palantir is what allowed them to do that. Now, politically, the speaker was like any other normal person, your choice, whatever you want to get vaccinated. So it's nice that the focus was on the problem like any other business would want to. So next was a nice award, too, that was given to Palantir for their help in the Ukraine and the refugee resettlement. This was an older article actually from last week that I missed, but it wasn't widely covered here, so I just wanted to bring it up. They're being honored with a special distinction for big tech building peace. Even if it doesn't mean anything monetarily, it's just more news out there that helps build up the reputation of Palantir besides their military work. And of course, it's just nice to see that they did something so humanitarian. And then next, we also got a surprising article on Palantir working with the HISA, or Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Authority, where they say progress has been made on the safety in the sport, more so for the horses. And they specifically call out Palantir and Amazon working to collect and analyze data, letting them figure out the causes of horse injuries and deaths. And with this info, the sport's becoming safer and safer, of course, for the rider and the horse together, and it can guide them more intentionally in the future when making decisions about the sport and, of course, making rules. And a quote here really shows the value that Palantir is bringing, where they're trying to bring down a five-hour process per race card to 30 minutes, which will allow them to identify these at-risk horses here before the races. So just like cricket, where we've gotten them working there, it's nice to see Palantir in these smaller sports that are not as common or widespread, where if they can be applied here, why not put them in the mainstream as well over time? 
Hey everyone, it's Zach with Palantir Research. Palantir is going to lose a major international financial institution as a client, and also more insider selling happening, with amazing marketing though by Palantir to keep winning customers, all while we try to figure out if the NHS contract is Palantir's or not, and much more to cover. So looking at the stock first, another volatile week starting out in the $16 range but dropping all the way down into 14s and flying all the way back up the day that Bloomberg released their NHS news that insiders are saying they won. So with Friday actually breaking deeper into the 16s with a high of 1670, this is the top end of that range I've been talking about the last couple of months here, where they're hovering between 14 to $16 range. So the big question coming up is, are we going to continue staying here or break through since we're basically on at that resistance area? So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. So what was all the news happening this week? So I'll briefly note the videos I already posted this week, but also close out on the newer stuff. So first video included a few items with Babcock, which you should be very familiar with considering there was a PR on September 13 saying they're using Palantir for the AIP product. Now we know they were doing work with the UK Navy specifically for submarines, and there was a new story also that the UK government signed a total of $4.8 billion or 4 billion pounds of contracts with defense contractors. And that's to modernize their diesel powered subs to nuclear. Now, Babcock was mentioned specifically in the PR, so there was three points I found important. One, more business for Palantir's client is better for Palantir, of course, and that's good for their business because obviously there's money to pay out, but also opportunities to showcase their value some more. Then second, this is a modernization of some Marines, so that means there could be more opportunities lying in wait for modernizing other aspects of the Navy or other branches of the UK military. And then lastly, the mission of Palantir being Western aligned is important because the motivations for modernization was to mitigate Chinese aggression. So although it's with the UK, they are also working with Australia nearby, so it's always great to see Palantir's customers winning. Now, also in the same video, we had the NNSA, National Nuclear Security Administration, present where the speaker talks deeply about their issues on modernizing as well as their aging and changing workforce so before they relied on experienced individuals staying for a long time but with people not staying the 30 40 years anymore now with only five to ten years the need for the knowledge to be kept in the organization and not lost when people retire or leave is even more crucial today so plus the security measures from Palantir are needed for their kind of business and processes where trackability is needed. So their presentation demonstrates how Palantir can bring your cultural and just plain organization across your whole org into the 21st century. Then the other video that was posted by Palantir covered is much more pragmatic and practical since it is for a commercial customer, Komatsu. They did a demonstration of how they streamlined their part services along their supply chain and ordering processes. Essentially, they brought a very real example with tying all their data together with Ontology while having a growing knowledge base amongst all their service technicians interacting with their single source of truth system that all lies together with the supply chain and AI chat features to capture unstructured data and make it usable. I know that's a mouthful. So with the NNSA and Komatsu example, it shows how Palantir is not just a one trick pony, but rather an actual operating system for the catered needs of each individual organization where they can build on top of that to bring them value. Then next, I covered Lockheed Martin's presentation, which focused on Apollo. So I know most people, it was a very simple example of them changing the colors on their display of the markers from yellow to blue. But I think for those who work in deploying software, even just code in general in a secure environment, we know all the big tech firms and new startups might use the hottest deployment automation. But remember, around the country, there are still folks where there are manual processes riddled in the middle of reviewing code and results before people feel safe to merge onto their production branches. But essentially, Palantir helps automate this in a secure fashion in an IL-5 environment. And the best part was that Lockheed Martin said they plan to continue expanding the use cases of Apollo to IL-6 environments and more use cases in general. Then we got a bombshell of an article from Bloomberg. Now, just being short of saying Palantir won the NHS, they have unidentified folks who are close to the process saying Palantir will be awarded the contract. Now, in my video, I made sure to say I'm wearing my speculation hat, but putting some clues together with Bloomberg being comfortable to publish this, as well as the other clues we have with the NHS England campaign to the public, that two million pounds there, I feel a little more comfortable thinking they're winning some or most of the contract for the NHS. Now, like I said, Things are not for sure yet or anything officially published, but Bloomberg putting this out definitely adds gasoline to the media frenzy fire. But I also want to note Yahoo Finance made a video about this topic as well, and I'll talk about that a little bit later too. 
Then the following day, Palantir and PwC wanted to let the world know they are expanding their partnership. I made a quick video on this because three things really stuck out to me that obviously will help Palantir around their expansion to more clients. And this isn't new news with them working together with PwC, but to formalize it and ensuring AIP is included in the PR is big already. So first, PwC has their own network of trusted clients that they've been working together with, and especially for those who aren't already working with Palantir. This is a big opportunity to get them more exposure and expand that. Second, PwC has their own consultants with their own expertise and may be better equipped to apply Palantir's products to these clients' issues rather than relying on four deployed engineers to start that process all over again and learning about the clients. And you might as well leverage all the networks you have already. And then third, if PwC is expanding this relationship, who's to know if other consulting firms that also implement software will start to do the same thing with Palantir at a much wider scale? Essentially, it could be the start of an avalanche effect that can speed up adoption of Palantir to run in the background without Palantir needing to run these implementations themselves and sending forward deployed engineers since they'll be relying on these other networks of consultants. And then in my last video is based on all the YouTube videos Palantir is posting to their channel. Now I'm not covering them all individually, but I've obviously explained a few previously, but let me know in the comments if there are any in particular that you want me to break down. But essentially I see three important outcomes that come from wrapping this up. First is they are providing so many use cases and examples from many different clients across so many industries, and that's to persuade others and have them visualize their own similar issues with their respective businesses to possibly sign up with Palantir. Second, this demonstrates the willingness of their clients to even share and talk about their experience with Palantir and just put a face to it. This is a huge networking opportunity for prospective clients to ramp up much more quicker since there are other folks who've already gone through the process and the same things, and these are other higher ups from other companies, even with their competitors. So it's hard to turn that down and feel like you're falling behind since you want to try to get on the same page here. And then third, clients are getting educated on Palantir's products, capabilities, and working language with FDEs even before clients are interacting with Palantir directly. So this can speed up the deployment process and increase client satisfaction because they know the possibilities and capabilities and can ramp up that much faster to their vision of how they want to use Palantir. But either way, it's always great to have more working examples to show Palantir is not a black box. We obviously don't have the source code to see the mechanism of this working on a technical level. But a little rant here, sometimes it feels like people keep calling Palantir a black box until they have that exact source code. But you literally don't have that insight into any other company anyways, unless there's an open sourcing that they're willing to share. So there's no excuse anymore to say, I don't understand what Palantir does. It's literally all here with examples and clients saying what it does in layman terms. And if you're a company, maybe sign up for an AIP bootcamp and then you'll get a really firsthand example there. Now, what I haven't made videos on, some bad news first. If you want to see it that way, I want to shout out Lord Grimm for finding this one, but UBS, who acquired Credit Suisse, looks to be retiring Palantir. Now, it's not necessarily a huge surprise considering they came into their organization through the financial rescue of Credit Suisse, which ultimately wiped out those shareholders. But Palantir, in this case, was working with them since 2016 on compliance. But since they are coming into UBS through a position of weakness and kind of just being seen as a leftover system that's being acquired here, it would be a tough uphill battle of miracles that would basically have them being kept. Considering they plan on cutting 2,700 out of 3,000 solutions, so that's 90% that they're cutting. I just wanted to add this in because not every news is going to be good on Palantir. And we all know, but sometimes we just need to hear it. And this is obviously the exception rather than the rule considering UBS wasn't the client where Palantir even doesn't have a chance to prove themselves and get that buy-in because they just got acquired. So they're probably just looked at as the baggage that can be cut to integrate the two companies Companies, but who knows, maybe in the future they may be considered again. Now the insider selling, more sales from Alexander D. Moore, and I feel like a broken record here, but feel I need to add this kind of news to my videos to continue educating folks. Just read the Form 4 SEC filing. These are always posted when major insiders are selling. He sold 21,900 shares, around $16.02 per share, so he got a nice exit price in the recent run-up for these shares, but regardless, look at the explanations below. This is from a pre-existing trading plan, and you'll see this is basically in the majority of the Form 4s, alongside tax reasons paying for options as other reasonings. But always remember to look at Form 4. Now, the counter argument is always, if you truly believe in the company, you'll never sell a share, of course, as an insider. Well, everyone has their own reasonings and bulk of shares, especially if you've been accumulating from over time. But this isn't a large portion of this director's remaining shares with 1.74 million shares remaining. So in the end, this is not news to me. 
then back to the NHS so Yahoo Finance titled the video Palantir Secures Contract with UK's National Health Service. Now this title is definitely presumptuous but if you watch the video itself there isn't any real confirmation yet on who won the FDB contract. Now I'm not trying to justify it myself, I definitely titled my earlier video on the Bloomberg article, Breaking Palantir Wins NHS Contract, says Insiders. But at least I let everyone know that it's per the insiders close to the talks, which is what it's actually in the article. So we're all playing this YouTube game here, and I just wanted to know this was something that came up and a lot of people were talking about it. I just think it's funny. But either way, with my speculation head on, there just seems to be more clues that Pounder can win this NHS contract or some of the NHS contract if they're sharing it with someone else and really just want this all behind once there's an official answer here. But always be careful and not just read the headlines and kind of read the videos or read the articles more closely. And then Alex Karp strikes again, but out in the United Arab Emirates or UAE, where he spoke at the ADIPEC, which is an energy conference. Now, it's a 40-minute interview and a lot of the similar talking points we are used to as investors around artificial intelligence and Palantir's philosophy. But I think the biggest significance here is that this is out in the Middle East first. And even if politics might not be the same here as we are used to in the West, on the commercial side, there was a lot of opportunity here, especially in regards to the energy industry. One question did stand out, though, at the very end, and Dr. Karp gave a very diplomatic answer where the interviewer asked what the UAE could learn from the U.S. when it comes to technology. Now, there's no denying innovation in software has been a bright spot for the United States, but he cleverly also speaks to the learnings and engineering feats that the Middle East has implemented and what they have to offer as well, and it's just to learn between them. So I think he took a very good approach in the interview overall. I think it was great for the crowd, and it was very business-friendly as well and understanding of the environment that he's in. And then the closeout on a lighter note here, Coach Rat made an awesome tweet, kind of catching the Palantir community by storm on X. He's calling AIP Bootcamp's Palantir's Tesla moment because people can actually take out their products for a test drive now and actually put it into their heads now how to use software. And also check out Amna's video on this topic as well on his channel, X Finance 411. He's a great speaker here, really expands on the importance of this moment, and also ties in the PwC partnership, which coming full circle, CoachRap is actually doing work with Pouncer products there under them. And a mini side note too, just for me to show off, Little Flex too, he stopped by my PwC video and dropped a comment. So I appreciate you both, all of your contributions to the Pouncer community. Hey everyone, it's Zach with Palantir Research. We've got a mixed week here in regards to their new headset product unveiling, but tons of deals getting awarded and signed, and a good amount of news too that I haven't made videos on yet. But all this is happening at the same time as the geopolitics of the world with the horrific events on both sides down in the Middle East here happening to the civilians and families. So looking at the stock first, Another volatile week closing around 7% up actually for the week. Now we were reaching into the 18s a couple times actually in the middle of the week, but selling pressure soon started to take place in that area there. Now this mid $17 range that we've settled on is still on the upper end of where we've been since that $20 run up, but falling back down to the 13s. So possibly there's many catalysts coming up here with earnings next month or maybe closure to the NHS contract. So we'll see how the market reacts to this. Now, what was all the news happening this week? Barta Science, whom is a movement health company that has worked with the DOD and other civilian agencies through the years. Now, they'll be using Palantir FedStar to securely run services on IL-5 required contracts. This greatly appealed to me when it first came out because it's the intersection of Palantir's bread and butter of the military slash government with healthcare. Now, the applications in the military are a no-brainer with training troops, but also rehabilitation and recovery. And then there's real studies already with the Air Force in regards to postpartum exercises to get female service members back into the groove. So check that out for more detailed thoughts. The next video, Palantir revealed their mixed reality headsets with their two products, which is the software aspect on the back end. Now, I go into my thoughts in detail, but right now, officially, this is on the defense end only. The military applications are obvious to me where this can eventually get down to the individual soldier level over time on the battlefield. So communications and plans can be adaptable as more data comes in real time from satellites and other units with actual visualization overlaying reality that can be split between life and death. So I wholeheartedly believe this will change the battlefield itself and will affect the course of history on who is leveraging this kind of technology here. Now, the fog of war can be lifted for everyone's eyes in as close to real time as possible with this kind of technology, and this will inevitably exponentially be greater than those who don't have access to this technology. Now, if both sides have it, it may be just who has a better algorithm in the end. 
Now, the commercial applications I also speak to in that speculation here in the video, every industry can use some form of mixed reality for training purposes and simulations and run through decisions before they're even made and having it in a visual manner. Being able to see how different options can affect the outcome can optimize the decision making of individuals all while seeing their downstream effects on others. And I even speculate this could be some individual civilian customer use over time, but I wouldn't hold my breath yet. This is a game changing technology in my opinion for Palantir and we'll see where this goes. Now, for some deals also that happened that I covered, Palantir released their PR regarding the $250 million three-year contract with the Army. This was already covered on September 26th on Defense.gov, but it really goes to show that some of info comes out later with a little bit more details and officially, so it's just nice to see them put this out there on the record on their website, but wasn't anything new. Then Palantir also joined the SOSA Consortium, which is the Sensor Open Systems Architecture, which is a group of companies and organizations that are trying to openly set the standards for software and hardware for the government. Government. So putting this together, this commonality can reduce cycle development time where there is a shared set of understanding here and a shared level of security. So it's just great to see Palantir having a seat at the table and being a part of this. Then. Palantir released more videos on their YouTube channel. Won't go into detail here since there's so many of them, but when you have a chance, take the time where you can get nice snippets of information from different clients where I really enjoyed the IRS's experience working with Palantir. You can always watch them on fast speed too to knock them out much quicker. And then we got a new deal that went under the radar awarded from the NIH to primarily the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus and its partners, which Palantir is mentioned as a sub awardee. It's a $30 million contract for the base of 18 months. We don't know how much Palantir exactly get, but at least they are a part of this. And there's also an option for four additional years based on funding and success. So I give more thoughts on the potential of this deal and the added clues of Pound to success in healthcare. So check that out if you'd like. And then lastly, Palantir also posted a blog post on Thursday regarding their AIP boot camps. So no crazy numbers given away here, but management still is saying there's overwhelming demand for AIP boot camps. And I think some explanation given away shows that the low barriers make it a good draw for customers. And the point of the boot camp is not to give away the fish, but to teach the customers how to fish on their own and also to have more imaginative use cases of outside of the chat features of AI, but rather automation on different processes in your organization. And it really comes down to that. Here, these participants can make AI their own and define how their AI architecture should be set up. And best part is, it's all industry agnostic. So come one, come all. Hope this really pushes their customer numbers up in the coming quarters, and this really helps. Now, what I haven't made videos on, there's a ton. There were a couple deals with international governments. Spain's deal with Palantir is under their Ministry of Defense for their intelligence side. They ran a trial for around 250,000 euros, but with that running successfully, they were able to leverage that into a larger 16.5 million one. So the article then goes on to some of the frustrations they have with low or no competition that Palantir has. But in the end, what I'm reading is that they really aren't finding solutions out there except for Palantir. And then another smaller deal with the UK government. It's a one and a half million pound contract for only five months. So it sounds like a trial period as well, but we'll see if this leverages into a larger deal later on. And it's nice to see them continuing to expand their business into different areas of the UK government, which is their second largest market. And then on the healthcare side, they won a $6 million contract in the United States from the Department of State for the medical provider portal. So all these government contracts add up and it goes to show all the stages that Palantir is winning them small, large, new and mature relationships. And then the big upcoming earnings to see any progress with customer accounts, at least for me, has been officially announced finally. It's been a while, but they'll be doing a pre-market earnings release on Thursday, November 2nd at 8 a.m. Eastern time. So I'll make sure to get up early that day to digest the news. I know it's very different than what we're used to with the after hours, but maybe they're just changing up for their own pace. And then Palantir takes a very public but not surprising stance for the Middle East conflict here happening between Israel and Hamas. They said exactly certain kinds of evil can only be fought with force. Palantir stands with Israel. Now, for the whole Israel and Hamas situation, and a warning first, remember, I'm going to be focusing on it from a Palantir investor perspective with taking a side because going into a company like Palantir and being a part owner of it, you have to know that going into it. So at the end of the day, I'll go over my own personal views, kind of, it kind of seeps through as a shareholder and what that means, but feel free to skip that, of course, but more deeply as a shareholder, the region as a whole and the history behind it, who has claimed to the holy land, it's always going to change on your perspective and when you cherry pick history. I'm obviously not an expert in the history of itself or the consequences of what's going to happen from all this stuff, but it can still be conflicting to me of how shareholders feel about holding the company with different levels of weighting and how you feel about a company 
but also having the financial thinking about the risk on and off scenarios regarding the stock and their philosophy and when these kind of events happen. Now, even though there was some sort of turmoil when Ukraine was invaded, it was pretty cut and dry, I would say, from a Western perspective here. So Palantir is not trying to hide their support here, and I'd rather have it that way than some covert way of supporting their side. But I don't think I'd have to say it. But personally, the humanitarian side of civilian casualties on both sides, I'm very sorry to see this happening in the world. It's the same in the Ukraine and Russia and conflicts everywhere in the world when we are talking about the governments here, but the actual civilians and families living their lives are just like us are the ones truly suffering. So I'm thankful to be in the country where I'm at in the United States and the situation is so remote from this that I'd never have to experience this kind of hardship. So I'm trying not to come off as biased here. But being a long-term shareholder who shares the mission and vision of Palantir and is aligned with the West, you should already know what that means in regards to the conflict. So I'll leave it at that. Hey everyone, it's Zach with Palantir Research. We've got another week in the market done for Palantir, but NHS doctors are showing their support here. However, it still falls short of any awarding of the FTP contract, as well as some interesting price action to close out the week, especially on Friday, but I'll also catch up on all the little news in between. So looking at the stock price first, we had some crazy price movement this week. For the week, we are down around 6.5%, right above the $16 mark. Now this week, we did hit into the low $18, but ultimately it could not sustain, and the majority of the downturn actually took place on Friday. Now, news-wise specifically to the company driving this down, in my opinion, there's nothing really to note here. Maybe you could argue the lack of news around the NHS contract not being resolved, but mostly due to the whole market reacting to Jerome Powell saying that rates still have to be higher to deal with the persistent inflation. So this is not surprising for a stock like Palantir, and to react to the news this way, that's expected. So for me personally, it's still noise and is expected for someone holding this long term, but still something to keep an eye on here. Now, what was all the news happening this week? I'll cover the videos I made, of course, but then the little things that I haven't covered. So first video, I covered the Bloomberg interview of Dan Ives, and he remains bullish on Palantir. This is not surprising. He spoke on their military business and possible ties to the Israeli Defense Forces, or IDF. Now, we don't know if that was more speculative or actually something he knows for sure, but it still points and notes how close Palantir is to the United States government. And if you've been watching the latest news, the U.S. is basically standing besides Israel in this conflict and sending out a lot of military support with aircraft carriers nearby in the region. But Dan Ives also points out that there is still a mismatch in understanding by the market of Palantir as an AI player and an underappreciated gem here, so he still thinks there's a difference here. Basically, he's still bullish on Palantir with the upcoming geopolitical tensions, and this is not surprising news. He just goes on the news, though, to spread it to everyone. Then in the same video, I also covered a contract revealed by the Financial Times that Palantir was paid about 4.5 million pounds back in September 2022, and that's for their work with the UK government that helps them to manage the Ukrainian refugees from the Ukrainian war. But just recently, they grew that contract by 22% for another year, signing in September 2023, and that's for 5.5 million pounds. So it's always great to see them growing contracts even if I think for this particular one, it may not be around for the long haul, especially since it requires the conflict to continue with more refugees coming. But great use case, of course, for future needs of the UK to handle refugees or for other nearby countries to implement something similar and handle that kind of case. Now, the next video I made covered Ukraine's Minister of Digital Transformation, Mikhail Fedorov, who shared a demo of their use of AIP in regards to reconstruction. So this is non-military. So the tweet is up here, but basically it's an example of how they could use Palantir outside of the war context. When running the demo, it appeared similar to a lot of other demonstrations by Palantir, like an analyst chanting and getting those answers from the computer that they need, and also to set up a project schedule timeline, which of course is talking to everything else, to safely set up how they can rebuild schools but take into account the dangers like minefields or other kinds of blockades or just active war zones nearby and of course certain areas can get their construction done sooner or later so the big deal here is that this is the first glimpse of reconstruction that we know about Palantir, and they have officially partnered with Ukraine on this matter here. And besides the refugee relocation, which is outside of that military part here, this is the only use case that we've pretty much seen so far. Then I also covered in another video, Allen Industries, briefly. It was a partnership announced by the company itself on X, and doing a quick Google search on the company name, you may have been redirected or just directed to allenindustries.com, which is a completely different company Company. It's a cleaning company, but the actual one here is for allenindustries.net, which is different. They're a small consulting firm for SaaS software, specifically for the agriculture, manufacturing, and healthcare businesses. Their specific post was in regards.
regards to agriculture and how they plan to help clients with their data from supply chain all the way to the futures market for selling crops and everything in between here. So think of a one-stop shop for your data if you are in the agricultural side. Now, there's more to see how this turns out here. It's just a small article, but it's always nice to see a new partner here. Now, what I haven't made videos on, Palantir continues to ramp up their marketing on X here. There's a few tweets, actually. They tweeted out some new FedStart partners first, making sure to note this makes an 18-month process, and they slimmed it down to six weeks for potential partners. This is a game-changing aspect, especially for startups and small businesses that want to get into business with the government, but they can't put that time, money, and resources into achieving and maintaining their IL certification. So I've covered a lot of these partners here before, but some of them are newer, of course. A lot of them actually are AI companies if you do look, look through them and trying to get a little niches here to help the government in little ways. So don't miss out on checking them out there. You can look into more detail on your own. The value proposition is so apparent and blatant in my opinion. If you're taking 18 months, a couple million bucks plus any maintenance that actually keep that and just change it down to six weeks if you go with Palantir where you kind of just let them handle everything except the stuff that you can really focus on. Then your business can do what's best for the government and provide that value because you're not dealing with all these other things of just maintaining your security. So if you're going to keep the customer happy that way, I think Pouncer has a very sticky solution in this case. So I've mentioned in previous videos that cover this FedStar program, this can help their type of monopoly, I say, or at least a huge gap in the market that Pouncer can fill with their routing and that they provide is just much easier for companies to do and try it out and see how it is to work with the government. And this could be before they want to make that large commitment of getting IELTS certified themselves. But hopefully at that point, at least as a Pouncer investor, that they're just going to stay so sticky to it that they don't even feel like they need to get their own IELTS certification. So more to see if they can expand this program even more. Then, Palantir also released a short 40-second trailer advertising their AIP boot camps. So nothing new information-wise here, but they are making it more worldwide where they just want to get the word out that the companies and organizations should at least hear about it and possibly sign up and take a chance here. They're trying to get customers to the top of their funnel and even put an example of a client from Trinity Jobs where they got the results they wanted in less than eight hours from an AIP boot camp, and they were able to present to their CEO the next day. So I think that's a very powerful statement here that even with a boot camp like this with no strings attached, I'm assuming that you can get a real use case that someone is confident enough to present to their C-suite there. And then on a lighter note, Palantir is going to space. Well, one of their mission ops leads, who's a payload specialist, Kelly Girardi will be going to suborbital space with Virgin Galactic or ticker symbol SPCE for those who actually follow that. This was actually one of those companies that experienced similar mania actually at a Palantir in 2021. They went public through a SPAC. I won't comment on their business and financials. Honestly, it's not my cup of tea, to be honest. But they do do some cool stuff, of course, making suborbital space travel for tourism and science experiments much more accessible with their reptile spacecraft. Now, for the NHS contract, I've covered in previous videos that they wanted to award the NHS contract sometime mid-October, and that time seems to have gone and passed. If you've been searching around, there have been several articles basically just trying to pull Palantir away from the deal and really trying to muddy the water around who can win this contract. One did particularly catch my eye that there was some assurances by a few doctors, and I seem to have missed this letter or maybe it was buried, but the one reference in the register tries to make the narrative that Palantir has not won because they wouldn't put effort into trying to win over the public, and they're talking about NHS England. So I think the opposite actually is this as if they did win, but they want to make sure that there are some people on board here, or at least the public is, and we can speculate all we want. But this signed letter basically covers that these doctors who've signed it worked closely with the trials and studies and see the value in the new FDP platform because it will allow healthcare workers to provide the best care and not deal with the technological difficulties. Now, they don't say pound here by name in this letter, but they reference their work with the COVID response and this new platform made a difference in the response and management of the supplies during that crisis. And then for all of us, this is obviously Palantir because we've known about this. But what I like also is that they provided a quantitative metric saying they reduced long-term stays by 36% at the North Tees and Hartlepool Trust. Now, of course, they're not attributing that particularly to Palantir, but it's using this new technology with the FTP and tying all these patient records together. So in the end, this is all very important for these doctors to put a stand here because they're saying that it actually works. Now, the way that people are going to spin it, of course, like the red Register, they may see it one way, but at least we got more information out there that something is at least happening here to try to push the deal through. Hey everyone, it's Zach with Palantir Research. We've got another week done here in the market for Palantir, but very red and some days actually really bloody, as well as some apps from Palantir. They want to share that with the open source kind of stuff, news regarding more marketing and Palantir showing their boot camps and many more. 
So looking at the stock price first, we had some crazy price movement this week where we closed out at $15.07. Now, if we look at the weekly charts down around 5%, I'd say that's honestly typical volatility for a stock like Palantir and that we've experienced in the last few months. So you can see earlier in the week, we were in the high $17, almost $17 range at 1690s, but the market came right back down to settle in this $15 range. So I know we've seen the 13s in recent memory, so it'll be interesting to see if this continues on downwards or if Palantir stock has found a zone to wobble around in the 15s or maybe pops back up. Now, what was all the news happening this week? And I'll cover the videos I made first. So first video I happened upon an article that Palantir is working with Ukraine's reconstruction. So it looks to be also a way for the country to create a service for other countries when it comes to demining. The Ukrainian article mentions that 500 million euros was raised by a few European countries and that Ukraine wants to create a market for these services. So we'll see in the future if more products like this come out of Palantir's collaboration with Ukraine and if it'll become a major revenue source in the future for the country and hopefully Palantir. The intriguing part is that this almost feels like a partnership between Palantir and a government to build a national business that they can sell out and export to other governments. I mean, they've built up their reputation as coming to help in the war immediately, so why wouldn't other countries feel there's some level of expertise here since they've been there since the beginning? Then next, I covered a video released by Palantir and their work with Ferrari. The major points here are that they've been in a partnership for six years and still going strong. I went into three reasons I like this kind of trailer here since it first puts their name out there to a wider audience, which of course means the chances of exposure to actual targeted customers goes up. But also second, it seems to be a way for Palantir to establish their name around Italy and their favorite brands, concerning Italian was spoken in that video too. And then third, it just goes to show how strong these partnerships can be after being together for six years and still working together and learning new things. Palantir can really showcase to potential customers that they aren't just dumping a product with them, but actually building value alongside them and are in it for the long haul. I do want to note though, I don't follow F1 closely, but do know and heard that Ferrari has not been a dominant force in recent times for the sport at least. So if it's more of just a branding thing in the country of Italy versus actually making a difference in their performance, we'll just have to see. Then, I made another video on a couple subjects, the first being their blog post on their government web services. So big notes for investors that they link their GitHub repositories for their open source stuff, so feel free to check those out. But also, they went a little more in-depth on the policy bot application that they've built. So I go into a little bit more detail in the video itself, but it's just another way for development teams to integrate multiple review processes to streamline which pull requests require a closer look. I know these blog posts can get tedious sometimes, but I think Palantir is starting to shed light on the tools they've been working with internally and making them much more transparent shows they are making strides to shed that black box reputation they have, even though I personally don't think they have that. Then that same video also covered the big news that Dresner ranks Palantir as a top AI vendor at number one. Now, if you read closely, the caveats here are that they share this number one spot with three other companies. And you can check out the visual too from the report and see that Palantir is performing well in their eyes on analytical features and functions, model operations, and usability. Now, if you take a closer look though, they seem to be lacking in neural networks, open source support, and data access. So look at that chart closely and you'll familiarize yourself with some of the names there also being compared, but the other number one companies you don't see in the media, so I'll need to do a little bit more research on them for myself. But still, I think it's great overall they made the list. Just remember these can be reviewed by potential customers and it's another way to keep on building up their reputation and trustworthiness as a company because their name is just getting out there on these kind of reports. Now, here are what I've not made videos on. Rishi Sunak was starting to meet with leaders for their UK AI summit. Now, Palantir is obviously a part of this and was mentioned as a partnership, but the timing is also intriguing because Palantir will be releasing their Q3 2023 earnings the morning of November 2 pre-market. So the event itself takes place between November 1 and 2, and if it's just coincidence, who knows? But I think this is still another important event because the NHS contract is still not officially awarded or announced, and this may be additional pull if for some reason Palantir still needs to vibe for the contract, albeit it may be more for optics and politics rather than actual testing of the software at this point. Now for me personally, still waiting to get the official win or loss at this point regarding the NHS contract, and no one knows if this delay in reward means they win or lose the contract. It's just people's best guesses at this point. Even despite the case studies the NHS published that I made a video on last Sunday, it doesn't mean anything because politics can still make or break a contract win. 
Just because you have quantitative evidence of improving waiting lists and speeding up appointment times, it doesn't mean the decision makers are actually going to care to improve those because even if it's just a little rant in the short term, people just do what they need to stay in office regardless of those who are ill-informed or well-informed going against their own interests for the long haul, just like healthcare, where it's something you don't see immediately. But that's just my take there. And of course, I have my biases being an investor in Palantir. Now, Palantir continues their marketing around their AIP boot camps. In their latest post, they had a podcast style looking video with Ted Mabry, who seems to be spearheading this whole initiative. He says AIP boot camps work because customers can solve real business problems within the first hour. Now, that's a bold claim. They don't worry about assembling the tech stack, but rather start iterating with AI immediately. And then the tooling with Pounder makes that possible. It's not about talking at the customer and kind of just presenting to them and telling them about it, but you're actually letting them work through it themselves, and but probably collaboratively as well with some Palantir employees there at the demos that actually matter to them. And this is valuable. He mentions this is two-pronged because it builds their skills with using Palantir as well at the same time. Now, the more I hear about this, the AIP bootcamp idea is really living up to what I originally thought to it when I first heard about it at AIP Con. These continue to remind potential customers of this avenue to work with Palantir firsthand. Now, if this compounds across other organizations seeing their competitors and peers attending, it may just be a side effect there and become a trend to at least give Palantir a shot. And it's also more to see if this actually translates to official customer accounts in the coming quarters when they release those at earnings. But I'm all for it as a shareholder right now because sometimes it comes down to quantity and just getting in potential customers' faces about this. So just keep posting about it, Palantir. I don't mind. And the main point is that these customers won't know you to even consider you without ever hearing about you or coming upon you. So in that point, it just makes sense for them to keep going. And sneak preview for my next video with earnings coming up this week on the morning of Thursday, November 2, I'll be going over the metrics to look out for and my expectations against their own guidance from Palantir, Wall Street's guidance, and just my general thoughts about those. But I also believe this upcoming earnings is important to start to see some level of validation that AIP is a true driver of growth for the company. Now, I'm not saying I expect them to overwhelmingly beat on guidance, especially on revenue numbers, but if they can start to get those customer numbers up or other related indicators, then that's good enough for me. But what I think is going to be more important is to look at the trend here when we get to Q4 and to Q1 2024. I know it feels like sometimes we're just pushing it off here, but with the amount of exposure that we're getting to the market with AIP, it'll be interesting to see how this overall affects the company because not only if you just jump onto AIP, you don't get that alone, you're going to get onto Foundry possibly and then maybe even Apollo here. So customers can keep driving up more growth over time even if the numbers stay down in the short term. Everyone, it's Zach with Palantir Research, a very eventful week full of NHS drama and more info coming out, but also the long-awaited Q3 2023 earnings. Also, low and high analyst price targets, who's additionally with a channel announcement you'd be interested to hear at the end. So looking at the stock first, the main narrative of the week was earnings. So the chart speaks for itself, honestly. Palantir started the week off in the $15, $14 range. But once earnings came out, and I saw this during my early morning live stream that day, pre-market was climbing and climbing as more and more folks got out the info on earnings. Now for the actual day itself, we closed off in the high 1790s and poked into the $18 though throughout the day. Then on Friday, continuing it on, just not at the same level, we hit into the 19s. But then we leveled off back into the 18s. And that's just also off the backs of a softening of the job numbers where the job numbers fell below expectations as a growth company. Pounter, even though it doesn't have debt, it's still beholden to interest rates because of valuation multiples affected by this. So basically, if we see the economy maybe showing signs of weakness in any case like jobs, then rates can be paused and maybe even go down, which is good for companies like Pounter. Now, what was all the news for this week? First, the BBC had an interview with Alice Karp since he was in town for the UK AI Safety Summit which I'll go over later in the video. But for the interview itself, I had a whole video, especially pointing out the chaotic nature of the interview, coming off more as a way to keep pushing a leading question or interrogation to form a narrative rather than actually being informational for the audience in the UK, which I thought was the point of this originally. And honestly, I think Carp thought that was the case too, but either way, I still think Carp did his best despite the rude nature of the interviewer who would keep interrupting him, especially as he was explaining why the leading questions were ill-informed or at least needed caveats explained. It's obvious what the actual goals were from the interview though, but regardless of that, essentially the big points were that Palantir doesn't sell data and this was funny because he said we've never done that for the past 20 years and she's basically trying to argue well you'll start doing it now which makes no sense if you understood what Palantir's products do especially in regards to intelligence and the military applications and the value they bring. 
But also, she tried painting Palantir as them giving away their product for free as insidious, like it was bad for the UK. But that literally gives the UK more power to stop using Palantir if it doesn't work out. It just shows how confident Palantir is in bringing value. And it was just plain confusing for me and I'm sure for the audience as well, because we all know what free trials are. It's common practice and it isn't controversial. And yes, some could argue it's for important health data here in this case, but Palantir is literally working with the organization who I assume knows or can at least attest to its value in some fashion. But either way, it's just confusing to the audience because you're trying to argue trying something for free is bad, but if the product is truly didn't work, wouldn't you just be glad you don't have the sunk cost of paying for something like that that sucks and you could just leave saving face and money? So I just rolled my eyes at these kind of questions. But they also talked about AI in general and how the world should proceed since they are there for the safety summit. Carp says his typical answer that it is dangerous in the wrong hands, so safeguards should be needed and that can be started with the AI safety summit, which he's there for. But check out my video there for the details or the interview itself. Now, another big piece of news regarding the NHS is from NHS England themselves. They are rolling out a travel program for patients who've been waiting more than 40 weeks for a surgery. And if they don't have something within eight weeks, they're able to do this. Patients will be reached out to via multiple forms of communication and can provide what radius of travel they are willing to do so that the NHS can find surgery availability outside of their regular local hospital radius. I also go through the FDP FAQ that they've published themselves as well, and how this literally points to Palantir and the FDP making this possible. And this is important to note because the foundation of making this program possible and to work is Palantir and the FDP securely tying all this data together in an ontology since these things are always changing and communicating with each other. And this keeps adding to the argument of expanding Palantir and the FDP because regardless of cost savings, let's say, this saves lives. I think most patients are willing to travel a little farther if they can in order to have a better quality of life or better yet, an extension of their lifespan and lifestyle. Plus, this compounds on itself to make patient waiting lists and surgery scheduling less cluttered as they clear up these backed up logs in the meantime for new surgeries to take place after this faster in the future. And out of all this, I'm hoping to see more programs in the future like this because you can coordinate amongst all the hospitals like this specific use case here. You can start using it for more specified patient populations and services associated with that, and it could be much more targeted. And even on the flip side, you could do something similar with clinicians, providers here to make their work much more effective and being able to get to the patients they need to. It's, so it's always great to see this kind of progress. And then earnings. This is the biggest story of the week. I made a whole thorough video, but I think I can do a speed run of this all in one paragraph. But every individual investor should do their own due diligence to be thorough on their own. But the major points are fourth gap profitable quarter, so S&P eligibility. Revenue grew 17%, which can be a turning point sign since revenue comparables were downtrending all the way to last quarter's 13% year-over-year growth, and but now it's back to 17. And now customer count, specifically for Marshall, had a 45% increase. That's huge. The overall customer count was still respectable at 34%, but these are strong signs to investors and the market that Palantir can possibly show the progress of their foundation of going after growth in the AI market. And then guidance. Guidance for fourth quarter revenue, if they hit the bottom end, maintains that 17% year-over-year growth. But if they eke out slightly above that and beat it, they would be at 18.5%, which of course would point to more progress and getting closer to over 20%. And then for full year 2023, they raised guidance from in excess of $2.212 billion to $2.216 to $2.220 billion. Plus the earnings call. I don't want to quote every single sentence here. So the main theme is management is confident and AIP is the growth engine here and it's working in their AIP boot camps as well. So check out my detailed video from the day of earnings for that thorough review. But as always, it's always better to check the source material on Palantir's YouTube channel for the call and their investor relationships website for the earnings report. And out of this, as I talked about the stock price at the beginning, the market took this very favorably. And honestly, it was a pleasant surprise to me. Now, what I haven't made videos on. Now, the UK AI Safety Summit itself, I don't have Palantir specific news in regards to this, but the outcomes of this affects their business. All countries in attendance, including the United States and China, signed the Bletchley Declaration. This statement emphasizes the vast opportunities presented by artificial intelligence, AI, for global well-being, peace, and prosperity. It also stresses the importance of safe, human-centric, trustworthy, and responsible AI development, and that's to maximize its potential benefits across different sectors in the world, like health, education, development, things like that. However, it also acknowledges the significant risks associated with AI, particularly in development of highly capable AI models, and they also highlight the need for international cooperation 
to address these risks or some level of oversight. The document also emphasizes the role of various stakeholders, including countries, international organizations, companies like Palantir, civil society, and academia, to ensure that AI safety is inclusive in its development. The key areas that they are focusing on include identifying shared AI safety concerns, building risk-based policies, and then fostering international scientific research on frontier AI safety. So they want to sustain an inclusive global dialogue on AI and continue to research to harness AI's potential responsibly. But let's be honest, we all know the United States and China and any other strong country will be, on at least on the military side, will be doing everything they can to get the lead on AI. Calypso AI announced their partnership with Pounter, which has already been known about, and I made a previous video about this a couple months ago, but the big news here is that their AI security platform is now up and running and available to government clients. So on the AI front, they are working with LLM security, they identify malicious attacks that can stem from or through generative AI tools, and also verification of the outputs and the decision-making progress here. So they try to secure different aspects in regards to using AI. Now, the nice point here is that they've already worked with numerous agencies currently like the DOD, Air Force, and Homeland Security, but it looks like they need FedStart still to easily ramp up to those IL certifications to do more business with these governing bodies. And that obviously has highly sensitive data that would fall under these security measures. So it's always great to see FedStart bringing value here and being available to see if this works. Then RBC rates Palantir at underperform with a $5 price target. Now, they're saying they closely monitor the retail sentiment since, in their opinion, can be the primary driver of the stock's price movement. They note it makes a tough stock to short in the short term, which makes sense right now. We're almost $20 here, but they still are concerned with government data and site trends and softening from recent quarters, which they believe warrants this $5 target. So not much to comment more, but everyone's got their own model and level of risk. And you can finagle Palantir's numbers, which on a little generous side goes a long way when it comes to multiples and how the person's perspective can reach their numbers. But even after earnings, I wouldn't expect them to change their rating or at least highly for their price target if they are going to be on a pure numbers basis without any assumption of accelerating growth. It sounds like they just want to keep seeing more evidence here and they'd probably raise their price target once the price is even higher. Then on the opposite side, HSBC upgraded Palantir to a buy rating with a $21 price target, and that's increased from $16. They cite the revenue growth can increase back to 20% and 22% growth for 2024 and 2025, respectively. And that's due to the defense business and what's happening in the world as more geopolitical events happen. They state next year the price could easily jump 25%, and they also believe that AIP is going to drive this growth and likely will push faster revenue growth without the need for rising sales and marketing costs. And then back to the healthcare again, Palantir released a video trailer of their partnership with Cleveland Clinic. And as a reminder, they have a 10 year partnership with Cleveland Clinic. So this is for the long haul to develop the best hospital platform, I believe in the world. And that's for them to spread to more hospitals over time if this is refined. Now, anyone working in healthcare should know Cleveland Clinic is a prestigious partnership and top hospital system in the world. And you can even say they are a must have client if you wanna make it big in healthcare. So side note, I've worked at companies vying for Cleveland Clinic's business and this is a top priority with putting bids for an RFP from them. So this trailer brought to light awesome info like the Hospital 360 platform they're building in their partnership, like I mentioned, has huge potential for other hospitals across the world. But for the usual time they take to calculate bed capacity, they reduced this down by 75%. So this is calculation time. And then Cleveland Clinic was also able to easily look out six weeks ahead to forecast their staffing needs. They believe this technology is crucial for patients to go through their journeys through the medical care process. And I just think about the collective health outcomes improvements that are possible across the United States if this can actually be the case at least for every major hospital if they can see these kind of results. And then back to the NHS. A big article, kind of a little clickbaity here to be honest, stated the FDP procurement process is complete. Now, just because that is done, they said there is still a full business case approval that needs to be done. Now, I don't know the exact process for the UK government to get this stuff official, but at least it sounds like we know they aren't evaluating or competing the products against each other anymore. So there shouldn't be any possibility of a new competitor ever coming back again. But rather, it sounds like they need official documentation and approval of how the winner will be used formally here. But we still don't know the winner and how Pounder will turn out in the end. So it's baby steps, but something that seems so close yet feels so far still. 
All we can do as investors is continue to be patient and trust in the process. You can believe Palantir will win or lose the contract, doesn't matter to me. And even if they do lose, in my opinion, it's not a make or break for the company. Like they won't be destroyed. It's still going to be a setback or a hiccup, of course, for Palantir, especially as AIP commercial, though, is going to take over the narrative right now. That's the point that everyone's looking at right now, at least from these earnings. Then we've got Joe Lanzio on the morning of earnings bright and early. He had an interview with Fox Business, not about Palantir's earnings, though. They get his thoughts on the general market and the Fed with its effects in regards to global conflicts and specifically Israel versus Hamas in Gaza. So still on brand and in the mission, they speak about the atrocities nonetheless about Palantir being proud to be working alongside Israel. Now, he doesn't go into specifics on how Palantir was and is working with Israel, but did say inspirations for Palantir themselves was a point that they prided themselves on when they finally got to officially work with the Israeli government. You can have whatever opinion you believe here personally, but if you're a shareholder, it should not be a surprise as a company that they are publicly and strongly standing with Israel as the United States ally, and you could say the closest thing to a democracy with Western influence in that region. CARP's opening for earnings strongly reinforced this as well. Hey everyone, it's Zach with Palantir Research. We've got a huge news week for Palantir. We did get an unconfirmed win for the NHS contract by Digital Health. Please note, though, the official statement from the NHS that procurement is still not concluded yet, but also lots of other little news with Germany, Kramer, Shyamon Podcast, Dan Ives, and many more. So looking at the stock first, we close off the week at a nice recent high in the mid-19s. We finally broke through that resistance over there past the 19-teens. Now, the overall market also did well, regardless of Jerome Powell's statements that the Fed will do anything to ensure they do not have runaway inflation. But the market seems to disagree that we shouldn't see any more rate hikes in the future and at least see pauses now. So any decreases, I'm not sure, honestly, in my own opinion, how long that'll take. But as the overall market looks to be roaring along, this actually helps Palantir stock out a lot. So next will be interesting to see if this can continue or hold since we'd have to test if this range will be supported. First, we all know that the big news that Digital Health has said Palantir has won the FTP contract because ministers have signed off and that the announcement will happen in a few days. And I caution this in the video that this is unconfirmed still and it's being spouted by Digital Health, which has put their reputation on the line here by doing this and they made sure though to cover their bases that they went for an official comment to the nhs who said officially that the procurement process has not concluded so be careful there we are still in the wait and see phase to ensure this gets officially announced but surrounding that i put out other videos around the nhs and some risks regarding that and there was a bailout funding that was rejected and most speculated that the reasoning is that the funding would rather be spent on tax breaks due to the endless pit reputation of the nhs when it comes to funding now if it'll actually affect the contract itself that is yet to be seen maybe that money has been set aside already but in order to cover the shortfalls nhs england did have to reappropriate funds from several improvement initiatives now pounder does have current contracts with them and that's what the ftp transition for 25 million pounds now if that gets affected who knows but either way it looks like as long as pounder gets the win for the contract this shouldn't be an issue now, surrounding this also, there's been a lot of drama around the contract this whole week, too, from government officials themselves. David Davis spoke at the UK Parliament and literally said, looks like the company who's going to win this is Palantir. It is just the wrong company to put in charge of our precious data resource. Even if it behaved perfectly, nobody would trust it. So basically, the UK just has to figure out what they're going to do with this and try to figure out how they're going to stake up the reputation for the NHS. I mean, if you want to take this as good news, I said this also that it sounds like maybe it's in the bad because he is kind of acknowledging that Palantir is more likely to win this now. And then even if you're against it, there's really no point. But also, it's just another avenue for them to get flack and try to rile up public backlash against Palantir doing this so publicly on TV. There's clearly a disconnect here between the trust of the people, the solution that people are actually going to use, like the providers, and then the decision makers and winning the contract. So we'll just have to see what actually happens in the end here, and hopefully that all settles down once it's all finalized. And then we also got news that the NHS FTP contract is met with another delay in mid-November. Now, early in the week, this was before that we got this digital health article here. Year. This is not surprising considering that the mid-October deadline came and passed. Now, the reasoning they said is because business use cases are still not thoroughly vetted enough. Essentially, they want Pounder to do more without winning the contract, or they need to clarify whoever the winner is, what exactly they are capable of, and able to provide it. Now, in regards to what the NHS or UK government is looking for, it was referenced that they want to know how the patient care interaction will be improved. 
So it's not necessarily how they become more efficient as a health system, but rather make the provider who interacts with patients much better. And what makes their life easier? And honestly, that's a fair thing to ask for because the point of the NHS is to improve the health of the UK and to do that as direct as possible means working with the providers. So more to see if we get official resolutions to this NHS contract. Now, the drama also continues in Germany in regards to using Palantir with their police force. So the state of Bavaria's newly elected state government is backing their continued use of Palantir, but working and waiting to see if they can push it all the way to the other states. Now, with the federal government in power in Germany, this seems unlikely to be resolved, in my own opinion, anytime soon in Palantir's favor. But if they continue to survive within individual states like Bavaria, Hesse, and North Rhine-Westphalia, or NRW, I'll continue to monitor the situation since it is big enough for Palantir to acknowledge with Alex Karp in the earnings call that some choice words there for Q3 earnings call regarding the push against them in Germany and also France, that he really doesn't agree with what they're trying to do in building out their own solutions. And then next year, we had a warning. This is not news, real news to me at least. But just so you're in the know, Pouncer came up in a lightning round from the viewer in Georgia um, on Jim Cramer's show. And this was on Monday for CNBC. He said they had a dynamite quarter and says to buy, 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 pushing that button there. It's kind of annoying. And says they're on that Palantir team and calls himself Mr. Palantir, the greatest phrase. So I'm not saying this is actual news here or if it really means anything. But the one shining light is that either way, at least Palantir's name is out there on the mainstream media and just gets more people at least impressions on their name and gets them at least name recognition possibly for other people who may have heard about them. But now they might look a little bit further into them. So as an investor, it doesn't matter to me if there's other investors figuring it out, but what matters is if there's a potential customer or C-suite executive who hears about this and potentially at least wants to look a little further into it and possibly become a customer. And then Citibank also continues to keep their sell rating for Palantir. The analyst, Tyler Radke, keeps the $10 price target, which is almost half the price it is now. I think we're around the $18 range. They acknowledge that Palantir's revenue was within expectations, so that's at least driven by their commercial performance. However, the narrative for them is that they don't like government revenue. They think it looks weak. Now, we know that it's going to be lumpy, and this happens where they just have very low growth, but also sometimes they have high growth. Now, they also note profitability also exceeded expectations but they're still observing and they're in a wait and see kind of moment here that AIP and the boot camps are actually going to work and scale out and bring in customers for the company. So they sound like they don't want to get overly eager here and put all their eggs in a basket, of course, so early and still in a wait and see mode since they want to see the sustainability of this turnaround and growth, which honestly is a big question for myself too as a Palantir investor. When we saw that 13% quarterly growth. That wasn't good at all. But now that we've turned it around at least for one quarter now to 17%, I want to see if this continues going up or at least maintains in the short term. Then we have Hirsch Jane, the head of public health at Palantir. He did a huge whole panel interview at the Milken Institute's Future Health Summit. There's a bunch of other speakers, but out of that 40 minutes, he did get a good 10 minutes there. And he was able to talk about Palantir, their philosophy, their background, their origins, but with also data and how they have a philosophy around that. But more importantly, their growing significance in the healthcare space and the ways that they're actually trying to help and improve that. So you can check out the whole panel or my video for my thoughts, but essentially Pounder gets more opportunities like this to get their name out there and teach the public potential customers how they are in the healthcare space at all areas of the ecosystem. We know that they're in the supply chain side, but they're also in drug discovery, as well as on the floor with nurses and scheduling them out at hospitals. So they're pretty much everywhere and they have a possibility to get in at different institutions this way. Then Palantir also posted a video on how their AIP boot camps start out for clients where they introduce time to building up their intuition with AI. And I did a whole video that summarized but also talked about the merits of the video post because I believe they did a good job in executing this with using real business language with a demo that even I believe non-technical people can use and honestly that helps with scalability. IT showcases the real life usage of AI, albeit it may be a simple example in the beginning, but either way, I can see a person at a company showing this to their manager, director, or sharing it amongst themselves even in the C-suite to at least convince someone or their boss of the possible merits of attending an AIP bootcamp. And the best part is here is that there's not really much you need to do. You either get a real use case out of it in the end, or there is no commitment, and you don't have to sign a multi-million dollar contract with Palantir like you had to do before. 
Now, this is what I haven't made videos on. Shyam Senker was on the Defense and Aerospace Daily podcast on November 7th. He talks about the significance of Palantir in the space and is widely known and talked about already, but always great to hear him drop nuggets about artificial intelligence and how they continue to serve the defense and aerospace industry. And shout out to Adam2 on XFinance411 who posted the whole podcast there. So if you want to support him, please stop by his video and listen to it on there if you'd like. Then, upcoming next week on November 16, AWS is hosting an Explore Supply Chain Optimization, Making Theory a Reality Talk. Alongside AWS, Monique Sharma, who is the Supply Chain and Digital Solutions Expert at Palantir, will also be a guest there. And this is huge because working with big cloud providers, you can get your name out there and brand hack alongside the widespread reputation of AWS with Palantir Solutions. So keep an eye out for that. I'll try to find information when it's available. It's just nice to see Palantir associated with trillion dollar companies because it's what they provide as value to them as something to host, then it's just another leading indicator, at least in scalability, that they have an infrastructure to pull off of this kind of value that they want to bring to the widespread market. And if they both grow together, that's a big win. And then Dan Ives does his media rounds and asks about tech. He gets to talk about Palantir, calls them the golden child. He really likes the building of use cases. And for me personally, I see this as more opportunities that the foundation of Palantir being able to scale within and across industries. As long as they can take their leadership from what these clients find important, it makes sense to standardize these over time as they bring value. And as long as they can take their learnings from what clients find important, it makes sense to standardize these over time as use cases as they bring value and they just come out of the box. He's been a Palantir bull here that really started that first spike in the price all the way into the 20s earlier in the year. I just find it fascinating where we are today and its consistency in standing behind the company right now. Albeit Palantir didn't make it too hard to do so with their better revenue growth in Q3 at 17% versus that 13%. But still, being able to put yourself out there publicly with a reputation can be difficult if a company is not living up to the message you're putting out. But Hey everyone, it's Zach with Palantir Research. The focus of this week was Palantir breaking into 20s right on Friday, surging up until the end of the market close, closing in healthily within the 20s. So for those who have been holding the stock throughout the 2022s, the single digits, of course, definitely found some satisfaction in seeing this, but also some inklings of insider activity this week on the sell side, and then NHS FDP back and forth, and some more news. So looking at the stock first, after a strong previous week maintaining the gap up, Palantir was finally able to push even further into the 2050s after testing it as a resisting point here around 20 and 19, basically for four days, Monday through Thursday. Now, the big thing to look out for is if this will hold as a support point going forward. Now, what was the news for all the week? So starting with the NHS deal first, and it was interesting because for each piece of FUD to come out against Palantir and the FTP, there seemed to be a coordinated response from either NHS England and or Palantir. So there was a ton of stuff that happened this week, but still falling short of any official win being recognized. So first, there was more FUD from the DAUK or Doctors Association of the United Kingdom, as well as the BMA or British Medical Association. But contrary to those, just on Wednesday, Amanda Pritchard, who is the chief executive for NHS England, she gave a speech to the NHS providers and said they are working to finalize the FDP to help clinicians. So I'm not sure if anyone protested her at that speech or booed her, but at least the administration still seems to be backing the FDP, and this is right to those providers. And second, The Guardian released some FUD regarding the government allowing insurance companies access to the biobank, which is intended to only be used for medical research and cure diseases. Now, if you read the article closely, you'll see there was no confirmation of any coordination of insurance companies using that database in order to steer any policy to block any sick populations. And this was also thwarted by Wendy Anderson on Twitter stating that no data is sold by Palantir and also NHS English who added their FAQ in the section about them not selling data. And on top of this, NHS England also released out more use cases of AI and obviously using their FTP to actually make these possible with a variety of use cases that patients can start to feel in their everyday lives as these pilots start to expand. As well, they also released another article on Friday on how they're expanding their COVID platform to more research. So there's no blatant call-outs on Palantir for that one or the FTP, but this is reference to tying multiple platforms together to make this work, which obviously would probably have to take that into account. So overall, a great job on Palantir and NHS England trying to stay toe-to-toe -to -toe on the FUD coming out, and that's regarding FTP and continuing to spread the word on how the FTP will help the UK. 
Next, Dan Ives continues to support Palantir as the golden child of AI and hasn't wavered yet with even the price being at where it is today. So he says there's an overall bull market coming for tech and not just for Palantir, but all the AI players here who are ahead. And right now it will be the ones who reap the rewards, but over time it will spread to the broader market. So he still remains a bull here and we'll see if this plays out to how he sees it. And then Palantir also did their official blog post response to the White House's Office of Science and Technology Policy, or OSTP, and that's for the national priorities on artificial intelligence. Essentially, Palantir lays out their opinion on how artificial intelligence should be rolled out and developed, and this is consistent with their mission and philosophies that they've been publicly saying for the last couple years. The major points are to ensure protecting the rights of citizens, safety, and national security when it comes to AI, but also doing it as most equitable way as possible so it's getting a diverse range of experts and opinions to help steer the path of ai without creating biases and keeping accountability there for everyone and then also with all this happening palantir wants to see that ai is not unemploying people in droves and truly enhancing human productivity and being used to promote economic growth and great jobs with all this happening alongside innovating public services so that the government themselves actually can utilize this technology with a framework that is innovative but still holds everyone accountable so check out the blog post for more details there and healthcare. And this continues to be a big opportunity for Palantir. They released a video on their channel with more information from Tampa Bay General. Great slides, honestly, in my opinion, that shows how Palantir plays a role in expanding their healthcare systems and that's their presence in Florida as well as in Tampa Bay. And then they also shared their results in operations to help staffing ratios, as well as clinical outcomes when it comes to sepsis, length of stays, and getting that reduced as well as speeding up the broad spectrum use of antibiotics, and also juicily the financial aspect of coding capture to ensure they bill for all the services they do accurately. So I actually made an in-depth video from one of my live streams on why it is important, because in my experience as a healthcare data professional my whole career, these are top priorities for all hospitals and health systems in America, and that's to reduce sepsis and capture codes and the obvious use case of nurse staffing. So I hope to see more organizations pick this up because of these specific valuable use cases and possibly modulize this. Now, Pounter then released another video, but on FedStart, and there's nothing new here information-wise, I believe, but always great to see more advertisement of it. And their main bullet point is that they have 50 ATOs or authorities to operate, so we can see how fast companies are starting to pick up and sign on and get down to work with the government in FedRAMP, IL-5, and IL-6 environments without having to do all that headache themselves. The time to value is a no-brainer in my opinion, especially for startups and for those who want to try out serving the government customers without putting too many resources into that. So we'll see over time if this continues to expand out more. Then we get all the insider selling news. There's no need to cover every single transaction here individually, but essentially we are starting to see some insider selling, which honestly isn't a surprise when we've run up right here. Now, proportionally, these aren't huge stakes getting dumped when compared to how many shares are remaining for these individual officers and directors selling. Honestly, it's just something to continue monitoring if you see if someone does offload a big portion of their shares, which can show us outside investors if insiders think this is over or fair value for them to de-risk themselves from the company. But it's ultimately up to you how you want to interpret this. And then all the 13Fs that came out. So of course, Palantir has their own 13F. And the big news here is that they offloaded all their Lilium and the Adhorrent shares. So while picking up Surf Air Mobility shares, now I don't follow these too closely anymore because at this point, these are more of a rounding error for Palantir. But I know for some in the community, Lilium was one of those SPACs that some Palantir investors thought they would be holding for a longer term. And for me personally, I trust management that they know what they're doing in regards to capital management, considering we've got a huge cash pile today and they've been prudent with debt so nothing alarming for me at this point to change my opinion on this then for the 13 f's on institutions buying palantir Overall, there's been more and more activity around scooping up shares, and in my Palantir Daily number 4 video, I showcased a few huge institutions that you all probably know picking millions of shares up, and some increasing their stakes by over 100%, and one even by 650%. So it'll be interesting to see over the next few years if we see any leveling off or an acceleration because of the S&P inclusion here that institutions will need to pick up and ensure their funds are weighted correctly. 
Hey everyone, it's Zach with Palantir Research. This week, Palantir won a monumental deal everyone has been waiting for, but also insider selling starts taking over the narrative for some at these recent highs. Plus, there was awards won by Palantir and being ranked a top AI company, and one of our favorite analysts also putting out her rating again. So looking at the stock first, Palantir was quite volatile last week, flying up from the 19s into the high 21s, but closing off the week back down at 19s. And then we taking a farther look perspective, at least with daily candles, we get to an interesting point here where we'll be testing out that $19 range again, which was previously acting as resistance before. So next week, price wise, we'll see if 19 will hold or if we further test downwards below the $18 range. Now, what was all the news for this week? And probably more importantly, after such an eventful week, what does this mean to me and what I'm looking forward to? So we got to start with the big news, which is finally closing out the NHS FTP contract. Now, it's important to note the media frenzy was utilizing the previous contract details as well as YouTubers that actually closed out in a February 2023 of 360 million pounds for five years with a possible 12 plus 12 extension or two years at 120 million additional pounds. So that's for a total of 480 million pounds. However, the official notice on NHS England's website indicates 330 million pounds, specifically citing seven years. So it's a very big discrepancy here. And then side note, this was expected, but Pounter does share this amount with other vendors listed as well in that PR. So digging onto the latest contracts finder data hosted by the UK government themselves, we're still able to find those previously advertised numbers like I mentioned, but the 330 million pounds contract is nowhere to be seen, at least from what I can find. So my guess is it might be wrapped up under a different name or project or has still yet to be published. So I'll keep an eye out there. But the biggest value though to all of this is still that qualitative shine. This gives Pounter the chance to demonstrate to not only the UK, but the whole world, what they can do at scale for such a large health system. And that's managing a whole country, basically. And plenty of other potential organizations may want to implement similar programs like the FDP over time. And quick note, just to be aware, some FUD still is coming out in regards to Palantir and the NHS. So even with the contract one, there can still be negative PR from those trying to tarnish the reputation of Palantir out there, or just that to make sure the FDP in general with the big culprit being information around there opting out, just trying to get people all confused about the situation. The FAQ clearly states, and this is on the NHS England's website, so this is just for research purposes that you can opt out of here, not for the clinical operations, which is what the FDP is doing, and it makes sense to keep it that way because you actually need to run this and have providers get access to that information. Now, the next biggest news cycle this week, insiders have to disclose when they're selling, obviously, because us as outside public investors need to have that transparency into their dealings with their own company stock. So quick lesson, we see the form 144s, which are the transactions themselves, but within two days of that transactions, buying or selling, of course, we have to get the Form 4s, which is the Statement of Change in Beneficial Ownership. So I've already gone over the transactions and changes in ownership in different previous daily pound tiers as they happen. But take the time to closely look, especially at Alex Karps, because I think he's probably the most important person to look at. And you can see the exact shares which are sold for tax withholdings, while the others being sold on the open market just after converting from Class B to A. Now, probably more importantly, though, is to look at Column 5, which shows the remaining shares post-transactions. And you can see the this number here for the class A shares up here and then down below you can see CARPS RSUs as well as class B shares below. And for one transaction too that didn't make it to any videos Friday, we got there later afterwards, we got another small insider transaction at 30,573 shares for a total of $602,000 and that's at an average price of $19.69. So that's pretty much it here. I'll keep an eye out for more transactions as well to more insider selling in case we do see anything of a larger proportion though that's more noteworthy. So the big news though out of the way, what else was important? Well, for OpenAI, their public display of dysfunction, you could say that, looks like went full circle with Sam Altman getting fired last week, Friday. And then ultimately, after the song and dance with Microsoft and the board, Altman has landed back at OpenAI with a new board. So we'll see if this has an effect on their image or products over time. But I'm still in the boat, at least on the face to enterprise customers, that OpenAI looks just a little less stable, albeit things have settled down now. Then we got NVIDIA's earnings coming out, and they were greater than expected, honestly. And this is its high expectations already baked in for the company. Now, you can check out the details on your own here with their earnings release, but essentially revenue and income are highly explosively growing. And despite geopolitical 
headwinds with export restrictions to one of the largest markets in the world, of course, with China, they still expect the decline to be offset by strong growth everywhere else. So if that isn't great science as a precursor, at least to artificial intelligence in general, which of course Palantir is a part of, then I don't know what is. But essentially, at least for Palantir, it will take time with this trickle down effect of providing compute to eventually do the things organizations want with the products that Palantir does with the data, of course, the company has. And with Croc Institute, they awarded Dr. Karp and essentially Palantir the Tech Freedom Award for all their work with Ukraine, Israel, and just standing up for Western principles through their actions and technology, as well as you can say their rhetoric and the way that they speak. So the importance of walking the talk when it comes to delivering products to much allies or against enemies of the world continues to build Palantir's reputation. And even though divisive, taking a stand today, in my own personal opinion, first leads to a better reputation socially because you'll never make everyone happy anyway. So why not double down on what you truly believe in and support? But also business-wise, customers knows exactly what they're going to get and what to expect. And we know this already isolates those who don't stand with the United States and the West, like China and the allies. But either way, you weren't going to be customers with them or working with them in general. And then Mariana Perez Mora, the big pounder bull from Bank of America, mostly I think because they see the holistic business opportunity for both commercial and government. But either way, they keep their buy rating and $21 price target. And they cited top line growth and margins as the positives and some upcoming catalysts with the NHS contract over with. They still bring up the S&P inclusion and the huge titan program for the u.s military so it'll be interesting to track this over time to see if bank of america changes its tone down the line in either direction though of course so it can go up or down and just to see if they have another reiteration later on so then palantir gets also the number two spot on everest group's first artificial intelligence top 50 list you'll see plenty of familiar names alongside like OpenAI at number one but also databricks and even c3ai surprisingly even with the bad press they may have gotten in regards to their products so it's great for the marketing part and and Palantir to tout out, which they did on Twitter. So hopefully to see more and more recognition over time as Palantir being a top AI player and hopefully being number one as much as they can when possible. Now, if you want a very long-term look at this, do you think Palantir will be around for the next decade? Do you think their products will become more, less, or the same in terms of relevancy, scalability, value given, and business generated for the company? It's probably not a simple cut and dry answer here, obviously, especially as more competitors enter the landscape, but also with the growing TAM, who knows how this will play out for sure and how big it'll get. I'd say in my own personal opinion here, the long-term trend is still in Palantir's favor, mm -hmm. even with competitors joining in because all aspects of businesses are going to be touched with some form of artificial intelligence, of course, with automation. But more importantly, what Palantir provides is the controls and infrastructure around that so that it's responsibly deployed or at least auditable for these companies. And then use this, especially in cases in relations to organizations, ontology, which I think is the most valuable part of this whole package here. And that's just what I think based on the demos, use cases, client perspectives, basically everything that is publicly available and told by management. Someone else with a different background or view can think otherwise, and that's okay. But that's my viewpoint on the short and long-term basis here, especially when I think it's important to share when all we see on the news and the charts is the whiplash and seesaw action happening up and down. Hey everyone, it's Zach with Palantir Research. Palantir Management reveals AIP is way better than expected and they got numbers to prove it. And we've got plenty of other news like awards, interviews, lawsuits, and much, much more. So looking at the stock first very briefly here for a second, we close out the week above $20. And on Friday, we were up around 6% for the week after testing some support in the 19s. But more importantly, lots of news that happened this week. So let's just get into it here. So first, we had a new AIP demo showcased by Palantir Architect Chad. So check it out. It's a 30-minute demonstration, but it's the best way to briefly describe it is that he showed the end product result first like a cooking show, but circled back and showed all the steps along the way, and he highlighted setting up virtual tables connected to BigQuery, and then also the pipeline builder here functionality that he wanted to note makes it so much more scalable as a solution so you can connect more data sources together over time as well as batching these. And he also wanted to demonstrate per the title the importance of text embedding that helps in semantic search, which is for artificial intelligence more powerful than just keyword search because you're trying to understand the meaning of the data and not necessarily just ensuring keywords are present, all while building out the ontology object and finally incorporating all these into the finished product on AIP logic that uses that. So it's a great demo for those who want to get more transparency into the AIP product and how it works. Now next, we have another interesting article come out here from NASDAQ, just noting that the average one-year price target for Palantir from analysts has risen by almost 9% in just a month. 
So the reason I wanted to point this out is because earnings came out at the beginning of November, and then honestly, in my opinion, is the biggest catalyst or driver of these price target changes for the analysts. Now, I'm not saying anyone should be beholden to the analyst price targets and do that for themselves, but it's still a cool data point here to look at, especially as we've seen this increase in interest in the stock right after earnings. And then upcoming next week, Pounder is a finalist to win an Energy Industry Award for the 2023 Platts Global Energy Award in New York on December 7th. So they're still waiting amongst several others if they'll be announced as the winner. But the specific category that they're in line for is the Energy Transition Technology of the Year Award. And I think it's nice already that they've even been considered and can point to this already for marketing. But obviously a win would be huge here and a cooler point to show clients, especially in the oil, gas, energy, or even just any client that may care about their footprint since Palantir's platforms heavily involved in measuring carbon performance and their close work with BP. Then our first media appearance, we've got Gene Munster from Deepwater Asset Management, LLC. The interesting story here, though, is that when asked about certain artificial intelligence tech names he likes, he brought up Palantir. And now, just looking at his firm's latest 13F filings, though, we did see that they sold around 50% of their Palantir, albeit it was a small amount for an institution, around 40,000 shares, and he sold around 22,000, leaving only about 18,000 left. So remember, 13Fs, though, just show the holdings as of the end of September right now, and we know earnings took place after this holding period and could have changed the perspective of Gene. So we'll keep an eye out for his firm's change in holdings next quarter's filing. And even if the NHS FTP contract has been awarded, we are still hearing murmurings in parallel about the deal and trying to question Rishi Sunak on it. He basically stood up for the platform and is saying that this is good for patients and reducing wait lists, and he points that out in his response to a question about NHS Scotland keeping their data out of the FTP. So it won't be surprising to see more pushes though to get that connected to the FTP over time and seeing if more questions will come about of this. Now we also got a Guardian article too who pointed out lawsuits may be incoming to NHS England here, which of course indirectly can be seen as an attack on Palantir. Their premise is essentially they are worried about data being stolen and being accessed by a spy company, Peter Thiel, Trump-loving company, which obviously is the opposite of the premise of the FDP. NHS England essentially said they don't know what they're talking about and why would they bring up a lawsuit anyways. If you understand the purpose of the FTP project, it's tying data together and Palantir is running that infrastructure to do so. And it doesn't make money off being a data broker here or gathering data or selling it. There's really no point in it. They make money from having a solution that actually helps their clients analyze their data and actually finds it useful there. So keeping an eye out though, I still won't be surprised if they still proceed with any legal action anyways. And on the German side too, it's been a bit quiet quiet, but we essentially left off at the Federal Ministry of the Interior rejecting Palantir for federal police forces and cooperation amongst the states. And now we get an update that in the Bavarian state, who has been an ally to Palantir, honestly, they're questioning if testing is even legal for them because of that catch-22 of you can't test real data because then it'll find real crimes to investigate, but it won't be legal to investigate because it's not legal yet to use that testing software. So it's kind of a funny way to think about it, but I guess when it comes to law, you do have to be precise there. So we'll see if one of Pound just few allies in Germany runs into Roblox some more and if they're able to continue running their tests on their own because the extent of this issue before was just not allowing Palantir and the Vera platform to be used across Germany but keeping the actual states who've been using it and actually want to that's a whole different story here and of course that would hurt much more but now even though that might be on the chopping block if a legal basis is not clarified here we'll just have to see how this plays out and then we got more media appearances here so first with Alina Svitolina the Ukrainian tennis player sponsored by Palantir she visited their London office to share her life in Ukraine alongside what her foundation does. And it's always great to see them moving on all fronts in regards to marketing and getting their name out there through different avenues and much more relatable like sports. And then we've also got the Reagan National Defense Forum announced with Pounter's participation. So Karp has spoken before and definitely not surprised he'll be speaking again with the acceleration of more geopolitical events. And I'll keep an eye out though for when it is released on the Reagan Foundation's YouTube channel. And then Shyam also had an interview there with CNBC, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. Later. And then we've got more mainstream media showing off Palantir on Fox Business, having Keith Fitzgerald, a Palantir bull, come on the show. So he was asked point blank if he's selling Palantir at the $20 resistance point, and he's like no, and actually says he wants to buy more. Now, at these levels, it didn't specify that he confirmed that he wants to buy at these levels, obviously, but went into how the long-term investing strategy really just wants you to hold on to winners, even if you're experiencing volatility like now. Now, if you want to buy more and there are opportunities to do so, why not? Especially if you like the company and its moat for the long term. So we'll see if this plays out well in his favor. 
And then the biggest news, I think Amazon Q was announced by their AWS CEO and touted the same talking points essentially that Palantir has been bringing up because it's not only in Palantir's product development bloodline, but also it's what enterprise cares about when trying to use AI. So Amazon Q is specifically a chatbot. And like I said, some talking points is Palantir with security, guardrails, privacy, and just ensuring your data is for the usages only and not shared or even used to train Amazon models. Now, the big differentiator here is to be determined is if the low barrier to entry, especially for AWS clients, will be enough to at least make customers think twice about Palantir since they have that invasive reputation here and probably just much harder to integrate. But also the values from Palantir is that the ontology and getting a true understanding of your data, whereas we don't know exactly the level of Amazon's ability to do the same, but they did bring up connectors at least so you can use your other products with Amazon Q and utilize your questions on those specific data sets here and its particular to your company, even if it's not hosted on AWS. So it's more to see on how this all plays out. In the end, we'll have to make note if the actual ontology will outplay here against Amazon Q's just connection of data. And then coincidentally or intentionally, Pouncer also released a blog post on their Apollo BTS or binary transfer service. They use Amazon's delivery process in Macanao. I think I'm saying that right now after a few comments and that's an island in Michigan. And it's kind of the old process or manual process governments use like burning software deployments onto a DVD and manually delivering it there. They were just trying to draw that connection here. And they basically use that comparison for their own Apollo hub spoke architecture in their product and their Apollo hub remote. And essentially you can read the article there. It's a little bit detailed, but it's more information on how Palantir can deliver safe and secure software deployment, especially when you have clients that are dealing with these kind of weird one-offs or disconnected systems. And then one item I didn't cover already in a previous video is that Dan Ives has also made the rounds with YouTubers this week. He was a guest on Tom Nash's channel and Amits. So I'm not going to steal their thunder there. So feel free to check those out at your own time. And the talks there just wanted to make you all aware that it's out there. Now, the biggest news of all, and we finally got here, I haven't covered yet, Shyam's interview with CNBC right outside that Reagan National Defense Forum. So right off the bat, they confirmed Palantir is helping Israel. He literally said he came from Tel Aviv before getting to the RNDF. And then talking about the demand for defense software, just making decisions much quicker is needed all around the world in different conflicts. And he even hints at the Pacific theater, which we don't hear about too much here publicly. And that probably means the conflict with China and Taiwan, and then maybe helping out our allies with Japan and the Philippines all in that China Sea area. But that's just my speculation. They are not confirmed. And among the coalition environment too, among everything between supply chains, combatants, civilians, everything has to be taken into account. And that's what Palantir is learning on the field right now. And they transitioned to government to commercial, and they talked about their monetization strategy and brought up the biggest part here, AIP boot camps with expectations that they'd sign around 140 orgs in November. But shockingly, he reveals they did 200 organizations instead and that they're on track for 325 by end of year. And this is commercial here in their main focus. And he also said they'll be bringing this to the government side for the US at least and using these boot camps as well. So it'll be interesting to see if this is going to boost their numbers also on the government side as well as commercial. And then they finally talk about Palantir government web services, which I've covered a little bit on here, but know that the broader media really hasn't. And I know it gets kind of into the weeds there with the different blog posts about it, but it's nice for them to bring it up here publicly and have other investors finally know about this and potential customers. But essentially these are tools that help bring more performance to customers and make it easier for them. And then they finally close out on the S&P inclusion and Shyam gives the reasonable answer of course he's in management that even though they're eligible there's no point setting up expectations on timing but rather the meaning of a true defense company actually getting included after decades since the primes and this is a much more powerful statement and he hopefully wants to see much more defense companies come in right after them hey everyone it's zach with palantir research tons of news this week related to government deals and other commercial deals but also plenty of other negative and positive sites all week to catch up on so looking at the stock first briefly palantir closed out the week in the mid 17s and which is down around 10% for the week. Now, taking a zoom out though for our five new day candles, price action eyes, we obviously fell right through the 20s, right through 19, and tested $17 as support. So it'll be interesting to see what comes next. Now, to start off the week strong, we had Dan Ives make an appearance on CNBC regarding his overall bullish thoughts on the markets, especially around tech. He notes bears have been too focused on interest rates and yields while ignoring the other indicators of strength in the market, and he continues to tout Palantir as the golden child of AI or messy of AI and says it's still one of the only pure AI plays out there. But that's always good to hear. 
but getting into the negative quickly, Pounter receives a negative William Blair analyst report, putting them at an underperformed slash sell with no price target. The bigger story is that they put a whole narrative around concern with a renewal of one of Pounter's large army contracts from 2019 with the Vantage program due to vendor lock-in or uncertainty around intellectual property of the data ownership. Now, there can still be a split of renewal getting Palantir less money here, but spinning off the story that they're unhappy with the IP in terms of what was a bigger concern around Palantir overall's reputation was what everyone focused on here. However, later in the week, it was shown that Palantir's head of communications first, Lisa Gordon basically saying there is no concern around that and continues to say the same statements that Palantir does not own any government or commercial customer data. So it's great for them to respond to this. And then later on that day, Shyam Sankar as well and the Army have their quote saying that they're happy with clarifying their remarks on data ownership. Basically, they're happy with the Army Vantage program, IP contract language, and the open data environment that they're currently using. So I made a video as soon as possible when that was announced to ensure that piece of the story is there. But right in the morning, William Blair doubles down and reiterates their sell under performance rating, which I think is fine since valuation is always an art, and you can argue either way with different points. But they reiterate that point of expect less in the renewal, which I guess if you're trying to move away from the big bombshell that you were spewing earlier about a relationship with friction and concerns with Pouncher's commercial IP license, sure. But no one was really fighting you on that there. So hope that's all over with and done with for now. While we're talking about the Army too, there's a couple stories too that came out of this, revealing the Titan program timeline, which is basically down to Palantir versus Raytheon, which is now RTX, and that's been going on for more than a year to do their prototyping. And we get a timeline that the single winner should be announced between January and March of 2024. The significance here is that we have officials themselves giving the time frame, so we'd hope that they can stick to it and potentially award this to Palantir if they are to succeed at that time. Do note though, we were expecting a decision here by end of year, but it looks like that was pushed back. And then even also on X, Shyam Sankar released photos of their headsets and the mixed reality and IC2 product visualizations that are part of their work with the Army. So the infinite screen real estate is what he pointed out there inside the striker, pointed out how useful this can be technologically, of course, for the armed forces. And then just using my own imagination, not needing monitors as hardware to be installed and powered on vehicles, opens up more opportunities and space for other technology to be implemented inside these vehicles. And then that compounding effect can really touch how military equipment is designed in the future and then produced. And then as well as their continued support in the Army, showing an ad for the Army-Navy football game, always a pleasant surprise here to sprinkle those into your marketing campaign just for that name recognition. And then we go on to some awesome news revealed by Pounder themselves on their AIP virtual table blog. And this was a post that had Tyson Foods having a quote. So they talk about the merits and everything, but they revealed in a customer quote by their staff solutions architect that they can clean up to their cloud spend by 40 to 50%. And that's just by removing large amounts of duplication and processing storage and to get to that single source of truth that a lot of organizations desire. Now, I'm not saying this will be typical results, especially if your organization has been pretty good about managing your architecture and your development over time. But many old school or bloated organizations just pick up different legacy systems and it can get a little bit disorganized here and stranded. And then these overlapping solutions in different areas of the company can remain duplicated. But given the opportunity here over time, a lot of these organizations would choose to be standardized and solidified together and really pin down their source of truth. So this, I think, is a huge selling point for these type of customers and hope Pounter continues to share quotes like these. And also revealed by Pounter, the HISA or Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Authority, they'll be making their platform developed alongside Pounter, of course, available to all their horse racing events under their jurisdiction by early 2024. The big note here is that it took veterinarians hours to do this pre-race check per race, whereas the platform skills is down to only minutes. So huge value there. And even better, Ted Mabry was quoted as saying, this is the result of an AIP bootcamp, and it's really giving the HISA the accelerant needed to produce a solution within weeks. And I think this speaks strongly in connection to management's comments on AIP bootcamps and the value it brings customers. When you can get a usable product so quickly like this example that can be implemented, then what's the reason to not sign on to Palantir? If you're able to get value and calculate that in comparison to the cost and the economics make sense, then this would obviously be the reason that we see such a strong demand for AIP when seeing 200 in November instead of that 140 that was expected. So overall, this is great to hear and then with management's positivity alongside this. So I hope to see more examples like HISA and Tyson. 
Then we also get a new demo by our beloved Chad that show off RAG and OAG. I won't walk through the details here. The whole thing's on video, but check out their blog post as well as that 30 minute YouTube demo. It's a great way to showcase their products for potential end users and can be useful marketing material as well to demonstrate during the sales process that there are a lot of resources at customers' fingertips in order to maximize the value out of Pounder's products and gain familiarity even before you have it implemented. So I hope they continue to post these consistently in the future. Now back on the negative side a little bit, we saw that huge sale by Sompo who sold around half their stake and were able to recognize a $584 million profit or 86 billion yen. Now for their answer, which is nice because we usually don't get one here, they're going to be putting this money into investments for growth through research and development and mergers and acquisitions, as well as shareholder returns here. So it's pretty generic and maybe coincidentally, but also for their Japan business, Pounter signed an expansion of their partnership for $40 million with Fujitsu. They'll be helping out disseminating Pounter through their Uvans platform and their customer base while Pounter continues to focus on their AIP expansion in the United States and abroad. They did an interview together on Fox Business talking about the deal and gave their perspectives on AI. And interestingly, they also asked CARP about potential military deals with Japan, but nothing revealed here specifically besides compliments for the US allies, as well as alluding to their interest in improving defense technology. And then on a quick note too, Palantir continues to keep their footprint in New York City, renewed their lease at 620 Avenue of America's in Manhattan. Just a cool footnote there to know that they've listed as one of the largest lease renewals for November. And then Palantir is also losing a director on the government side here, Earl Scott. Nothing huge to know besides he was working on the Air Force logistics side at Pound here since 2022. So good luck to him, and hopefully this isn't a trend of departures starting or indicative of anything else. And Palantir continues to be very proactive in their support for pro-Israel in their stance there. They are opening 180 positions for students that may have been experiencing anti-Semitism on college campuses. You can have your own opinion here on this, but I think it's a good way of getting the right kind of talent into their organization, considering their mission and full-hearted support for the West, and noting how the organization's product Products have been developed over the years. It's the people that make it. And regardless of where you stand on the Israel Hamas conflict, it's pretty cut and dry, at least where Palantir stands. And as investors, you should understand that. So they'd want people to work there who can stand behind that as well. Hi everyone, it's Zach with Palantir Research. Busy week news for Palantir with wins on multiple deals and other announcements. With analysts reacting to the Army contract extensions and Palantir being a $50 stock. So looking at the stock first briefly, Palantir closed out the week only a percent up. The most active days near the end of the week was when the price flew up all the way into 19s, probably on the backs of the Fed pause and rate cuts coming in 2024, but also that army deal here that we won. But throughout Friday, those gains were actually given back up and Palantir fell to actually lose all that steam to be slightly red to close Friday. But we'll see what happens next week late in December. Now, news-wise, earlier in the week, Barron's released an article regarding Canada's big pension fully selling out of that Palantir position. This is pretty typical from these news agencies to get clicks where they can put that big pension name exit in the headline, for. but in reality, it was a pretty small position for the Public Sector Pension Investment Board, or PSP, which they are big at over $200 billion in assets. However, their Palantir position was only 111,000 shares. So tiny in the grand scheme of things here, and I also took the liberty to check out the institutional selling at the time of the video, which showed in institutions appear to be net buyers still when it comes to active positions with over 117 million shares increased versus 41 million shares decreased with those already having active positions. Then Palantir gets a new deal with Plasgrad, which is in the plastic upsizing sector and considered an international commercial deal with them out in Canada. They're focusing on Palantir to refine their supply chain logistics for their plastic waste feedstock and optimizing their operations. Palantir's footprint in the environment is nice to see that they can flexibly work across industries and Palantir also is big in the oil and gas for energy. So having this kind of deal showing they can help track and optimize while reducing waste in the world is nice, even if their go-to oil business is actually a net contributor to more plastics in the world. And we've gotten an update to short interest on Palantir shares for up to the end of November. And at the time, there's 121 million shares short, which was a decrease actually in overall number of shares short. And that's in relation to the float. And this percentage currently stands at six and a half percent. So no sign of a short squeeze, but the decrease of 17% is at least noteworthy to point out. What's more important to me is to follow this metric and see if this trend continues because of decreasing short interest, even if backwards looking can show investors are positioned in closing out or opening short positions, which can lead to motivated buying if covering for any reason. Then we get another international commercial deal with Unicredit announced for five more years. So that's a long time here. This cool part is that they've already been working together.
together since 2018. So with this new deal here, and if they do it to the end, that would be a 10 year partnership. And that's longer than actually many marriages. But with the main priority here, it's still driving efficiencies for the bank across Europe. And a nice nugget in the announcement is that they actually said that they got a fourfold increase, that they had an increase of customer redemptions for their protection products through better targeting. This can mean that Palantir can just parse the data so well for them and operationalize it that the heavy lifting of identifying these folks really becomes that much easier and boosts their success rate. And then Palantir's reseller PVM got a gold tier recognition as an authorization for them in the U.S. government channel partner program. Essentially, this means they are more equipped to better sell and implement Palantir for USG clients, and this is recognized by Palantir. They've been working with them for 12 years, and I have, at least assuming, eased the burden of FDEs needed on the government side, as well as taking on more intricate government jurisdictions across the many sectors they cover from public health to intelligence. And then we get a Bloomberg article on the struggles of Palantir and Anderol as well in Europe's military government business. The most interesting point is that they showed there's over $1 million that has been paid to Palantir for their part in Ukraine, but that's from the U.S. government side. So we know these donated services have not yielded revenue for the company yet, at least in regards to Ukraine, but at least they accurately point out other deals coming out of this partnership with targeting war crimes and reconstruction here. So we're still in the wait and see mode of what this actually gets for them, but the whole article lines out even with the geopolitical uncertainty, especially in Central Europe, it has been a struggle with getting Palantir and Andrel in those markets against local vendors, even if they're lower performing. And then politically as well, this can be seen with trying to wean off the U.S. dependence and getting away from working in our interests. So this will take more years to actually play out here. So what Palantir can do is just keep ensuring that their U.S. strategy continues to thrive. And then the biggest news of the week, I'd say Palantir won an extension to their Vantage platform contract for an additional $115 million for one more year. So the original Original contract of $458 million has already played out and all options have been utilized. So the plan to transition through this phase, but it seems that the army needs more time to actually do this. So Pouncer essentially got this extension to buy them more time. And no, this is not an increase, nor is a decrease in revenue for Palantir. That 458 divided by four ends up being around 115 million per year. So this extension just keeps the status quo. And then when you talk about this deal, you got to expect it now. But William Blair's De Palma had to add this is still bad for Palantir because they didn't get another four years and the next phases will have them get less revenue per year because of the multi-vendor environment, which I'll add Pouncer is enabled with the Vantage platform that they built out. But he sees the army also weaning off Pounder because they did their job in actually building this platform that allows this. So with De Palma confirming he wanted the exact same contract again replayed after that extension, he can cope with being right, I guess, in his mind. Now, closing out with Mariana Perez Mora's statements with the Army contract extension, she reiterated her buy rating of $21 per share, so no change there, and said the one-year extension was actually unexpected. Now, similar to my thoughts also, the extension is in line with the annualized rate of the original contract, not more, not less. Either way, they still say Pounty is remaining in a strong position for data-centric operational strategy for all their customers. They are still bullish on the overall strategy for AIP capabilities and standing behind the commercial aspect and the go-to-market strategy for Pounty that seems to be working. But Pounter continues to share its product demos, posting on the AI mining process, allowing customers to automate and figure out points of their business operations that can actually be improved with automation. So it's a 37 minute demo, so it's pretty long. So check that out on your own time. It's on the Pounter developers channel. And then their latest blog post too on their recommendation for the US government is in regards to AI policy and the frameworks and allowing the country to leverage the technology responsibly. It's a quick read here, so check that out too when you have a chance. And Pounter being a $50 stock. Specifically, which ones you still believe in. You have been bullish on Palantir, and it has had an incredible year-to-date run. Well, thank you for remembering that. This is a tough business. It's very nice to hit one out of the park every now and then. Uh, I still am bullish on that one. I think that company is still getting started. The problem with it is not that people don't understand it, which is what everybody reports. (laughs) They simply can't wrap their mind around AI. Consumers don't get it yet. That, to me, smells like opportunity. I think it's a $50 stock a few years from now. I swear, I just saw a bird fly past your head if that's a live picture. Keith, lovely to see you once again. Thanks so much. So if you know Keith Fitzgerald, he has been a pounder bull here. He went on to Fox Business and did his Friday interview. Now, when asked about tech in general and the names he's likes, he's not into Intel, but still behind NVIDIA and the whole AI movement. And he said... Pounter is a $50 stock to him. Now, there's no time frame here, and we know market cap-wise, especially with today's fundamentals, that would be very, very expensive there. However, if we see certain growth, right, it's possible. But either way, it's so crazy to see this kind of price target out here being said by someone. Now, it's not an official price target, too, I would like to say. 
However, when asked about Palantir, he thinks the main issue is not people understanding Palantir itself as a company, which I still think is actually an issue, but I think it's more of just not understanding the potential of artificial intelligence and how it can actually compound into other industries, which Palantir can be a part of and scale throughout. So there's a lot of opportunity here, and I think Keith also sees that, but we'll have to see how it actually manifests though in the stock price. Saying $50 is pretty bold, but either way, it's I think Palantir has a bright future. Hey everyone, it's Zach with Palantir Research. We got the busy week leading up to the holiday all over the place from raging protests to awesome unofficial AIP numbers and much, much more. So looking at the stock first, we closed out Friday down over a percent heading into the holiday where markets are closed on Monday, just so you know. Then for the whole week, Pounter ended up not being able to hold over 18 and was down 4% for the week. So we'll see where Pounter closes out 2023 next week into the New Year's holiday. Now, news-wise, starting off with the week, the Pounter community was kind of divided or at least had more active banter regarding ticker symbol use video. Now, some folks didn't like the idea of calling Palantir doomed in the thumbnail and bringing up certain hypotheticals or just calling it a clickbait that could be bad for Palantir in the future. Now, essentially, the rise of competitors and the difficulties of scaling in such an environment, even with a superior product, could have its challenges. And just for the broader conversation as well here, so not necessarily for the video, I'm not counting anyone out yet, regardless of what we've seen from Microsoft with Fabric, which I'd say is closer to Foundry, and then also Amazon Q, which would be kind of a chatbot, so the shallow aspect of AIP without an ontology, or I can say even Google, but I'll keep that as a question mark, but who knows? They've got the resources and distribution, especially with their cloud customers, and that might be enough with the foot in the door method and stall out customers to give them some time to get up to speed if they do. So I'll leave it up to you to form your own opinion here, but feel free to check out Ticker Symbol Use channel if you're interested in watching out the whole video. Then, Palantir continues to share not only their own products, but how they work in the field of artificial intelligence, and in this case specifically, I'd say machine learning. So they go through a whole blog post on pre-training, uh, check it out for details of course, but I think the coolest part was just giving the before and after pictures that shows the pre-training and how it affected the identification of certain objects. So the use cases of this is important militarily, but also commercially as it becomes vital to track more objects with satellites and improving that process, and it's all here on their blog, so check that out as well. And then we also got some quick comments from Akash Jain, the president of Palantir's U.S. government division, continuing to give kind words regarding the Vantage contract that was won last week or two weeks ago at this point, and the value it shows that Palantir brings to the United States Army and their continued partnership. And then we got some of the bad press here with a lawsuit circulating, so nothing new, honestly, in my opinion, and isn't surprising when there is any significant price drop, at least from the peaks here, but I'll let you be the judge of even if that's even a big drop. But essentially, just the law firm trying to get a class action together of Palantir shareholders together who believe there may be fraud or other unlawful business practices from any officers or directors at the company. So a nothing burger to me personally, just understand if you're new, this isn't really something out of the ordinary, honestly, with these firms trying to find opportunities to get money, which ultimately would be the shareholders pockets too, if you think about it as a shareholder. Now, if you're needing to put any resources to this as well, and it might be a frivolous suit, that would just be a waste of time. So just keep that in mind. And then we got those cool undisclosed or maybe even confidential numbers from a LinkedIn post by a PwC director. We get to see here, at least after the points that we've seen after Shyam's RNDF interview, that it, apparently they've gotten 414 boot camps with 634 organizations and 27 industries and 1,000 participants. Now, for everyone here who has been following the channel, and I played this already in my Palantir Daily when I covered this, but Shyam Senker at the RNDF said they expect to serve 325 organizations with boot camps by the end of the year. So if these numbers ring true, and note these aren't officially disclosed, at least the ones in this image here by management or an official press release. So that would be positive, of course, if this is true to exceed expectations that were set earlier. And I was a stickler, though, too, for Shyam's wording. But if you meant 325 boot camps versus the undisclosed 414 boot camps here, and that would be 27% more than expected. While if it was 95% more, if you meant 325 organizations versus 634 organizations. So we'll see at the next earning, most likely on the the official progress, although I'll err on the conservative side here since it's not made public officially and I would rather go with the lower number. Now, while talking about undisclosed numbers, we did get another unofficial kind of source of Palantir helping out the police out in London. And we've got a detective here on LinkedIn showing he was a participant at an AIP boot camp. Essentially, with these kind of murmurings we see around outside of anything official, AIP is doing stuff and boot camps are starting to show not necessarily in everyday life, but getting closer and closer to that point if it ever reaches a level of normalcy at 
at least, for maybe the career driven. And it would be a good sign of adoption if more and more folks, even across different industries, start to show this participation. And then also, we have the fresh face here. We got Doug Philippone, who's a global defense lead at Palantir. So with everything happening out in the Red Sea and blockading ships and the trade in oil and kind of the effects there, they took this opportunity to basically say these kind of conflicts popping up everywhere is a way to avert global and U.S. attention from certain areas. So the big ones he brings up, of course, are Russia, Ukraine, Israel, Hamas, and China, Taiwan. So in my own opinion, the U.S. government will continue to be involved in global conflicts in the present and the future. And I dare say, too, that if even if we have a more populist, isolationist kind of candidate in the future running the government and somehow gets into power, I highly doubt the military industrial complex machine of the U.S. would stop overnight, albeit maybe some isolationism could come out of it and foreign policy there. But the economic power of the United States is still a symbiotic relationship with our military power around the globe. So without each one, in my opinion at least, neither one would be as significant in the world. So we'll have to keep an eye out here and see where these resources are allocated in the future. And if Pounder could be a part of it, that would be nice for as a shareholder. And then Dan Ives, he continues to make the media rounds with two interviews, one near the beginning of the week and then another near the end. And he was basically blowing the bullish whistle for 2024 around tech and the growth of AI. Now, what caught my attention was he thinks the street is actually underestimating earnings by 5% to 7%. So nothing else really new, new, in my opinion, still saying to follow the use cases of AI and how enterprise software is a big opportunity. Pouncher, of course, gets the mentions alongside other big tech names here, the Magnificent Seven, and says the new tech bull market has already begun with a wait and see approach as more and more bears are coming out here. And he believes a soft landing is being set up for an environment for tech to do well, too. So nothing surprising or new here, at least from these multiple interviews, but at least the market is slowly getting informed about Palantir in these little interviews, as well as that overall tech story. And honestly, the big narrative he's pushing is the soft landing, which would be a big thing for growth stocks, but also the overall markets. Next, Palantir also released their AIP demo for Santa Claus. It's pretty brief here, but shows how any company around the world who deals with any global operation can utilize this. It might seem silly, but in all actuality, this is just as good as any test data or demo to show how an enterprise can utilize Palantir's products. The applicability of customer destinations or any of the nodes in your supply chain, while taking into account, let's say, the weather, timing, scheduling, your suppliers, maybe a disaster happens, something unexpected, and such as this, it's it's applicable to a real-world business as well. Well, as it is to Santa Claus. But I'll let you be the judge of who has the harder job there, of course. But good for Palantir to take advantage of the holiday opportunity and have some fun with it. And then we get a small little tweet here from Shyam Sankar stating he just saw the work himself up close. And this is in reference to the demining operations happening out in Ukraine here. And this is, of course, while the war is still going on, but there are areas that need to be rebuilt and at least start the process. So there was an AIP demo a while back here, and it was about their usage of demining and planning around certain areas like schools hospitals, and any other vital locations that will be civilian heavy. So although we don't get the specifics here, it's nice to see that management is up and close and is working alongside these here and making sure the value that the products are bringing to their clients is actually working. And these actually have big things at stake here, especially people's lives and safety. And then we also get a brief interview from France's intelligence product replacement for Palantir. The CEO of Chatvision, he gave an interview here in French. He basically states that Europe is going to be a tough market to implement intelligence solutions here from other countries and hopes their strategy, of course, is going to be buying their way into companies and hopefully serving those domestic markets. So, for instance, he thinks they're in Europe, of course, and they're a French company. But if they were to try to do business in Germany, it'd be tough and they'd need to partner up or maybe even buy up a German company to do business there. So I'm not sure why this would be even different from Palantir if they set up different offices there. But just knowing that the headquarters is in France, it might not even be working out as well for them. But we'll just have to see if they can spread throughout Europe too. And then the hot topic, at least out in the UK here, so there's a bunch of things kind of at play, is we've got the protest first, so that's outside the London office for Palantir, and a lot of social media campaigns going against Palantir kind of piggybacking off of this, even though they are kind of related, but not necessarily. So now there seems to be a confusion on what exactly these protests are about, because it's about Palantir supporting Israel, while also trying to bring up the NHS FDB contract, and not wanting Palantir to fulfill that technical side of the project. Now, I think it's overall a nothing burger here, just a lot of confusion. 
confusion. But as well, we get some bandwagons on X, as well as the Good Law Project that I pointed out, trying to capitalize on this heightened attention. So there was an email campaign there circulating around saying that Palantir hired the PR firm, and that's to help with the misinformation surrounding the FTP, which I think is normal. And you can look at the email here, at least there's a sample of one of them, but they were twisting it in such a way that they were trying to silence a good law project or something of manipulation when in reality, just read it here for yourself. The people advocating against this campaign are getting manipulated, so it's kind of ironic in this place. And this can actually be part of the NHS's educational campaign we've heard about before, but I'm not here to confirm that here and to help with truly understanding the FTP. But it seems that this other side would rather have folks be ignorant about it and look silly advocating against their interests. So the classic tale here, either way, it's just a mess and I'll monitor for anything substantial, but at this point, I think it's just a blip in the radar. Now, on the other hand of the spectrum, supporting the NHS FTP platform, we've got an article by Stephen Childs. He's giving his perspective here on the FTP and he's the managing director for the NHS's NECS or North of England Care System Support. So he points out a few metrics here showing the FTP has done so far. These aren't necessarily new, but he does point out three things to help ease worries about Palantir. Now, if people actually listen to this or care, I don't know. But first, he says that they have more UK employees, at least in their London office. So there are more people who live and work for the UK under Palantir than California and Denver, which if you know about the company, you'd expect a US company to have more of their employees in their headquarters and former headquarters where they started. But no, in actuality, they have more in London. And then second, the most important actually, I think, is that they are software company. So making sure that they aren't controlling or selling or stealing the data here. It sadly does have to be keep being repeated here because the bots on social media or just people who don't know, don't understand, or don't care about misinforming here, just keep repeating that point. And you're happily posting on a social media company as well, fully knowing their business model is your data, while Palantir has no motivation to do so, but helping their clients use it themselves. So even on that front, the motivations for Palantir to even monetize the data isn't there, but they're not gonna listen to that regardless. And then third, Palantir has reputable partnerships, and it's odd to me personally, people don't want the leading edge of technology for their health system, whereas only prestigious institutions should only have it, right? Right? Cleveland Clinic is always the one I like to bring up there, but either way, the contract is still pound tears, and it's nice to see someone from the NHS put out more of this information and repeating the truth. Hey everyone, it's Zach with Palantir Research. Palantir closes out strong with new deals, shorts covering, and more news. So looking at the stock first, the stock closed out the last day of trading for 2023 down 2.22% and the week around 3%. So that means we're going into 2024 with this price of $17.17, meaning the final year-to-date percentage for 2023 is 168.7%, and the new year's 2024 year-to-date percentages will be based on this price. So overall, I'm not sure who would have had fully predicted Palantir would be here at the end of 2023, but taking this longer term look for a year is very nice, although some would argue if they bought at all-time highs, not so much. Now, news-wise, we started off with talking about Palantir's mix with commercial versus government revenue. As we've seen over time the past two years, the quarterly mix has actually been maintained with a 45 to 55% split. Although you can argue commercial technically grew a couple percentages more at 43% over two years versus 41% for government over those last two years. I don't believe this trend will stay the same, but can be offset by large government contracts if those were to flow in. But hopefully AIP bootcamps can convert into revenue generating customers and we see this accelerate and shift the tied towards 50-50. Then also, the UK's official government contract website updated it with the NHS FTP contract, which has Palantir named as the awardee. You'll see here it does show a £180 million award, but note in the description this states it can be upwards of £330 million. So it may just be the initial period of money that's available since the contract dates are only for three and a half years versus a full seven. And they note this contract is awarded as services are provided, so in the end, not even this £180 million is guaranteed. But at least Palantir has the opportunity to actually implement and prove themselves at scale at the NHS, and hopefully this can lead to more contracts branching from the FTP. And then Palantir gets a juicy six-year deal for an international commercial client out in Spain. Mutua Madrilena is a large insurer out in Spain that covers life to auto as well as investments and pension. Now for some background, Etherscore actually posted these links way early in 2023. So the pilot period appears to have finished and Mutua Madrilena was happy enough to move forward and sign a long-term deal with Palantir. Unfortunately, we don't have a dollar amount here specifically, but it was noted in the article that Mutua has been investing 200 million euros into improving their technology. So Palantir may be getting a piece of that pie from this allocation. And then we get a new short interest data, which is shown 
and further shorts covering with positions down 10% from the last measurement. The total float shorted right now is 5.95%, so the trend in the right direction for those who were worried about downwards pressure from those selling and making short positions. Now, it doesn't mean this can't shift, and plus this data is always delayed by a couple weeks, so this is more informational than actionable in my opinion, but I'll continue to track this. Then we also had Kathy Wood selling around 100,000 pounds of shares on Wednesday from her ARK W fund. It's not significant to me personally on the size, so I see it more as a rebalancing rather than actual sell signal, but you never really know with Cassie, so just take that information as you please. And then lastly, I posted a recap of the more monumental moments in 2023 in my opinion. There were plenty, but I wanted to point out the five biggest that came to mind first, which are the S&P inclusion and hitting those requirements that will allow them to be included sometime in 2024, most likely since they hit four quarters of gap profit making the sum of their last four positive as well as their last quarter positive net income. Then we had the introduction of the artificial intelligence platform, which was one of the first enterprise solutions out on the market and piggybacking off that, their new go-to market strategy that appears to be doing well, which is AIP boot camps that appeared later in the year. And then we had the Ukraine Reconstruction Partnership finally getting announced, which shows after basically a year of work on the military side and working with the government closely as well as on the targeting, we get an inkling of future endeavors in the country. And then lastly, the awarding of the NHS FDB contract contract finally officially going to pound here, although they still have to prove themselves, it looks like, and they finally get a real opportunity to showcase to other countries and their health systems around the world that their capabilities are for a large and extensive healthcare system like the NHS in the UK can actually work. But thank you for watching the last weekly pound video for 2023, and I'll see you in the next one in 2024.